And welcome to the Connected Library pre-conference, everyone. I will hand it over to Kelly Sitzman. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the Connected Library pre-conference. Um, it is a rainy morning here, so I hope all of you have your coffee. And um, we are going to make this the most engaging first ever virtual pre-conference for OLA. So thanks for being guinea pigs. Um, I have to give a spotlight to the Public Libraries Division. Um, they are the sponsoring DROC of this pre-conference. As outgoing chair, I have to give them props. So I hope that after today, if you're not already engaged with Public Libraries Division, you will consider joining for the um, low fee of $2 per year. Um, it's a great group of folks and we talk about topics like this and more. Um, and also, I hope that after this session, you will consider becoming more actively engaged in OLA. Um, we just had elections and congrats to all the new officers. But over this next year, I hope you consider um, attending meetings, seeing where you kind of fill in the gaps uh, with your talents and strengths and get involved in OLA as an organization. So welcome to the Connected Library. Um, hopefully you know what this pre-conference is since you registered, but if not, I'll just give a brief synopsis. Um, so this pre-conference is meant to break down the concept of turning outward into key steps. Um, today we are hoping to empower library staff at all levels to take action and share your library story nationally, at the state level, or within your own unique communities. Um, we're going to have a series of interactive activities um, that will help you learn to identify and build community and library relationships, craft an effective message that inspires library support and investment, and hopefully you'll create networks today to support future endeavors of becoming a truly connected library. Um, this pre-conference parts of it are based off of the engaged library from the Chicago Public Library. There was a report put out by the Urban Libraries Council. Um, so a lot of what you'll see here is pulled from that. So giving them props. Uh, I did not create this from scratch, but um, a lot of those activities were pulled from that. So that's a resource you can use in the future um, with your own groups. And I encourage you to. Um, you will need to go ahead and get your packet ready. So from the Amigos conference page where you connected to this um, pre-conference, there is right below that link um, a series of handouts that you can download. So go ahead and get those ready while we're getting all logged in and settled in. Um, you can print those if you want to use the paper version. You can download them um, if you have an ability to edit digitally, whatever floats your boat. Um, just have those ready so that you you can um, fully engage today. Um, we're going to go over a little bit of etiquette. This is maybe a new um, platform for some of you. It's called Big Blue Button. Um, it does have a lot of features that are familiar from Zoom or some of those other platforms you may have been using during this time. Um, but we do ask that you mute yourself, um, if only just to block out the background noise. Um, I do want you to feel encouraged and empowered to speak up today um, and share your thoughts. And in fact, lots of times we will stop and say, anybody want to share? Um, so just be sure to unmute yourself first. Um, you can also turn on your camera if you want. Um, today's session is all about connecting with other people, so it might be nice to see faces. Um, there will be a breakout session at some point, so you will be forced to see one another of you. Uh, maybe not forced, but we would like for you to connect that way, so feel free to turn that on if you like. Um, there will be breakouts, as I mentioned. So at that time, you will be um, moved into different groups. And um, Amigos is here for tech support. So if you have any issues, just type it in the chat. Um, but they should kick you automatically to your rooms and then bring you back when it's done. So um, don't be surprised if a separate tab opens when that time comes. Um, there is a whiteboard feature that you should be able to see on your screen. Um, you'll be asked at some points to share on your whiteboard. Um, I actually am going to, there we go. I just turned on the multi-user whiteboard feature, so hopefully you can see that. Um, and once we get to that point, if you don't see it, just type in the chat and someone will reach out and help you. Um, and then just engagement and timing. I really want you guys to, especially since we're virtual and it isn't, um, it's a kind of a little different type of setting for a pre-conference, I do want you to engage um, and be plugged in. So um, please feel free to share your thoughts. Um, we also 
are on a tight schedule. We do have some speakers scheduled at very specific times. So if I do cut you off or we have to end a conversation um, prematurely, don't be offended. Um, in fact, we do encourage you to follow up with one another after this. So um, just know that it's all in the interest of time and I wanna be respectful of getting you guys out on time as well. Okay, it looks like the whiteboard is working. So I'm gonna turn it off until, <laughs> until it's time. I see Rebecca's on there. I don't trust her not to just graffiti all over my slides. I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so these are our learning objectives for today. Um, so I hope that you come away with these three bullet points of how to identify um, and strengthen your connections within your community, um, assess and connect your library's assets to the community, so it's a two-way street, um, and then create a community-minded culture among your library staff and stakeholders. Um, but ultimately, what's not on this slide that I really want you to take away today is I want you to apply this. Um, all of this is meaningless if it stays on your notepads. All of this is meaningless if we don't turn this into action. So um, as with many things in life, you get out of this what you put into it. So I hope that you take great notes today and get ready to um, put this to work, you know, get to work in your communities. Um, so you're going to have the opportunity today to hear from a bunch of different community leaders around the state who are regularly advocated to. Um, you'll hear and learn best practices of how to effectively create lasting and meaningful connections. Um, you'll hear from a variety of speakers throughout the day that offer their own perspectives on how to connect in uh, the perspective of business, nonprofit, government, and even the library standpoint. So I hope that um, that will you'll get a lot out of that and feel free to ask questions. Um, again, we're on a tight schedule, but we hope that that interview um, will lead to some good questions from you guys. Um, and again, I just really want you to engage with one another and build your network um, and really think about how you can make a difference in your library or your community. Um, I challenge you to think outside the box. I want you to remove any limits or restrictions. Um, if there's something that instantly you're like, I can't do that. I want you to push that aside and really be open minded today. Um, I want you to take note of that restriction and why you feel that's a barrier. Um, so don't totally disregard it, but we want you to have um you know a sky's the limit kind of attitude today while we talk about some of these concepts so we do have um a pretty good group today pretty well a great group you're all wonderful but pretty good size group so in the interest of time i'm going to ask that you all share your introductions in the notes field so if you look on your left hand side um, under the public chat there is a tab that says notes and it says shared notes so in there you can click on shared notes and type your name your library your job title, and then your contact information. Um, and you don't have to do this right this minute, but at some point throughout the day, I want you to, um, oh, and it looks like you, this is, again, you're all guinea pigs. Uh, looks like you can type over people. So um, again, just throughout the day, add your info in there. And we would love for, um, this will be archived and we will share this out and we would love for you to connect with one another after this. Um, so you're building a network today, you're connecting with people um, in a way that you can follow up in the future. Um, and take note of who, who's here today because you can relate to some of their situations in your conversations um, or even find someone to be mentored by. Um, that would be a really awesome follow-up relationship to build. Um, that's great. I see a lot of you typing in there. Um, so, and I see Scott Martin is on the call. So he is our first speaker today. So um, Scott, I think, there you go. Let's see. If you're able to unmute yourself and share your camera, I will give you an introduction. Oh, all right. While he's getting all set up, um, here is Scott Martin's bio. He's our first speaker today. Um, and Scott is joining us from Business Before Hours, a monthly chamber event that they host um, early in the morning as a networking event. Um, but Scott Martin is a proud Oklahoman born and raised in Tulsa. After high school, he attended the University of Oklahoma. 
With a political science degree in hand, Scott dove headfirst into public service, spending 11 years working in municipal government. He furthered his public service career by living out a dream and was honored to be elected to the Oklahoma House of Representatives for six terms. He was the epitome of a citizen legis legislator working in community banking while serving in the legislature. Since June of 2017, Scott has led Norman's premier business advocacy organization, the Norman Chamber of Commerce. Scott and his wife are the proud parents of four amazing children, and between church and ball fields, the family enjoys the outdoors, adventure, and an active lifestyle, which I know is true because I saw all your pictures from your recent trip across the country. Looked like you were having a great time. So welcome, Scott, and we are so glad to have you here with um, public libraries from across the state. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me all right? I realized uh, right when I was logging in that I was supposed to get my headphones. So are we good? Yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for being here. Um, why don't we start off by telling us a little bit about your relationship with libraries, either personally or professionally? Sure. Well, I'll give you a little bit of both. Um, recently, I, I spoke to an arm of the Pioneer Library System a few weeks, well, I guess maybe a couple months ago now. I brought with me uh, my library card from Tulsa Public Library System, which is where I grew up, and it was my very first library card, and I still have it. And so I've loved libraries from a young age and uh, recognized their value. My father, even as a, a senior adult, he spent a lot of his time in libraries, and, and so I, I love uh, what you guys do and what you're about. As Kelly mentioned, I had the good fortune of serving in the legislature, and my last um, half of my tenure, I, well, almost all of my tenure, I was very involved with the appropriations process, chairing the appropriations committee, and for the last few years, I chaired the appropriations subcommittee on education, which uh, oversaw and, and uh, helped guide and direct the appropriations for uh, state libraries, and so I, I really uh, came to better, I think, appreciate and understand the nuances of libraries and um, have brought that into my work here at the Chamber of Commerce, as we mentioned at, at our previous meeting, that uh, partnerships are really critical and uh, have been able to bring that into what we're doing throughout the business community. Absolutely. Well, you've been such a great supporter of libraries. And as we mentioned uh, right before this, you were uh, hosting Business Before Hours, a monthly networking event that brings together all different types of businesses from across the city of Norman. And today was uh, Pioneer Library Systems uh, sponsoring episode, if you will. Um, and so we got to meet virtually since we can't be in person. But talk to us about that event a little bit and tell us from your perspective, um, the power of networking. Why is networking so important? Sure. So in Norman, we're lucky to have three monthly networking events, two after hours and one before hours. And uh, we have sponsors for each of those. And like you just said, today was Pioneer Library System. You guys were the sponsor of that. So it worked out really great. It was great timing. Uh, we had hoped to be able to do that in person, like so many things, just like this conference, but we, we weren't able to, so we, we met virtually. And uh, we look, in, in the Norman Chamber, we look at networking as kind of a multi-pronged opportunity for our members. Uh, certainly, uh, first and foremost, I think it's a way for business owners and their employees to get together to expand and grow uh, their business. Uh, you know, connections and relationships, which I'll talk more about relationships in a little bit, but uh, are so important. And in today's, whether, whether it's 100 years ago or today, relationships still matter. And we uh, provide these three opportunities a month to help facilitate that. And then I was thinking uh, in response to this question, something that we probably take for granted, uh, but haven't lately. And that's the socialization of those networking opportunities. Uh, I love the, the Zoom calls and, and uh, virtual things have been great. Um, I find myself trying to set a Zoom meeting when I could just pick up the phone and call somebody. It's kind of awkward. But I, I love that the, the um, 
uh, interconnectivity of the call. And I think that um, in today's world, when we've all been a distance from each other, uh, the socialization is so important. And, we, and like I said, we take that for granted. And so those networking opportunities provide a wonderful opportunity for all of that to happen. And I've seen relationships that have been built that have helped grow somebody's business. And that's what those are all about. And we're, we're very fortunate uh, to be able to provide those opportunities. Great, thanks. So let's talk about advocacy. That's kind of a big word, um, but you are someone who was, at, well, you were and in your current role were advocated to regularly and you also regularly advocate to others. So talk to us about your time as a legislator. Um, what was the best way to communicate with you and your colleagues? What messages really hit home? What didn't work so much? <laughs> sure. So uh, you have to remember that I was elected in 2006, and uh, it's not that long ago, but in the realm of technology, it's a long time ago. Social media was not that big in 2006. I remember sitting at the Capitol and creating, I think it was a LinkedIn account or some, some social media account that I created in the midst of a legislative meeting because I was told I needed to have one. So I, I did it then. Um, and so we were, I was in the infancy of a lot of those things. Um, it changed tremendously in my um, 11 years, but uh, the underlying theme that I want to get across to people is that word relationships, regardless of how you do it, it's important that you build a relationship with your legislator. And, and I always encourage people to do that um, outside of the confines of four months of a legislative session. Uh, take the time the rest, rest of the eight months to reach out to your local legislators, get to know them, have them get to know you. So that way, when you're in the heat of the battle, whether it's an appropriation issue, it's a policy issue, you can uh, contact them on a friendly basis and, and let them know where you stand on a particular issue. Now, I, I, I hope that each of you may already have that relationship, uh, that you have the cell phone and of your legislator and they have your cell phone uh, because at critical times, uh, legislators need, need to be able to reach out to you and say, hey, what do you think about this particular piece of legislation? I need some insight. Um, we are not experts on every issue. Uh, we all come with our own experiences and background. And so um, for me personally, I rely on uh, the knowledge of others to be able to help inform the decisions that I was making. Now, some for me personally, uh, I really valued emails. Emails were my uh, best way uh, to organize my day, organize how I would communicate with my constituents, and um, and I really enjoyed that. It was and I was the one that was answering all of those emails. Uh, we don't have large staffs in the state legislature. Uh, typically, you have an assistant during the session and if you're lucky enough outside of, of the four months you're at the state capitol uh, you have a assistant uh, that can help you out but for me i managed um, all of the incoming and outgoing emails myself but i wrote all of those which was uh, i think it was smart looking back on it but at times it was very daunting because i would find myself sitting on the couch at nighttime responding to um tremendous amount of, of correspondences that way. Not to say that I didn't enjoy letters, um, but, but I just uh, found that I could more quickly and promptly and thoughtfully respond to people via email. Now, not all legislators are like that. Again, that's getting to know your legislator because some, to be fair, uh, their style was they would have their assistant to respond and say, thank you for emailing, you know, representative so-and-so, um, they'll look forward to taking your comments into consideration, that kind of thing. 
so you need to know uh, your legislator and how how best to communicate with them. Some of them, uh, some of them very much enjoy social media and being able to communicate with folks that way. And if that works for them, great. Uh, then take advantage of that. Uh, but one thing I will tell you that that um, I found to be a, a negative, okay, was um, online petitions. They're very popular, uh, particularly change.org. It was the bane of my existence. Uh, you could go set up a online petition. You could add my email to it or whomever else you wanted to, and all of a sudden I'm getting uh, nondescript emails from all over the world in some circumstances. There was one hot button issue in particular that came up that I was had nothing to do with, but I was added to a uh, change.org petition, and I and I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> I received over ten thousand emails, and so I had to. Um, I contacted our IT folks at the state capitol. Was like, you've got to figure out a way to work on this for me because I couldn't. Even if I responded to all of them, they were going to reply at change.org. It wasn't going to the person that emailed me. And so in my attempt to be prompt and, and be responsive to people, I couldn't even do that, let alone I was getting emails from Australia. And so there weren't my constituents. It didn't really matter, right? So as you think about corresponding with your legislator, um, we all are involved in associations, whether it's library related or personally related, where you get a template of an email, text, something of that nature that says contact your legislator. Well, I would encourage you, if you want to take that template, that's fine, but uh, make it your own and personalize it. Uh, and I always found that if you can have the ability to add your um, add address, your home address to it, that goes a long way. Uh, because while I I did my best to respond to, to um, communication outside of my district. I certainly responded to my constituents. And so it's important to know uh, who you're communicating with. Great. Thank you. Not to put you on the spot, Aiden, but as chair of OLA's advocacy committee, do you have anything you want to add or um, ask Scott related to, to that topic? No, I would just echo everything that he said. Anytime you can um, personalize a message, really um, bring in the human element to it instead of a robo, uh, robotic type response, that seems to work best. And definitely, um, I'm glad that I'm getting to present after Scott because he's talking about a lot of things that I really am going to emphasize in terms of just building that relationship. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Thanks for that segue, Scott. Appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Lisa mentioned in the chat that constituent is a powerful word, word too. So, um, and for some of us, we may work in different places than we live. So that's also good to know of who your um, legislator is for where your library is, but also for your home as well. So Scott, um, I can't believe you didn't mention the pies. Um, that's something that libraries have done really well is bring you pie. But um, on the larger scheme of things, what do you feel like Oklahoma libraries are really great at? Sure. The pie was a high point. I'm, I'll, I'll be honest with you. It was great. So I loved it. Uh, but a high point for libraries, in my opinion, is uh, you guys are can be honest brokers in your community and and I think be seen as, as a trusted advisor um, and you reach such a diverse population okay so um, a lot of people will just look at libraries and, and think of it uh, in terms of books and books are important very much important but libraries are so much more than, than that in today's world. And so um, I have found in my experience that the folks in the library systems, whether it's on a local level or statewide level that I've dealt with, um, they were people that I could trust. 
And that goes a very long way in politics, uh, trust and honesty. And so um, those are things that, that you guys can bring to the table. And again, uh, you touch so many people and you do so many different things. And that's where if I were to give you some advice, it's that uh, think of the things you're doing outside of the box or maybe the unknowns that a lot of people aren't familiar with and educate your policymakers on those fronts. Um, one of the things that, that, that Pioneer, I think you guys still do, I'm not quite sure, but we used to have um, the big read and every year uh, we got together for lunch and you'd have uh, policymakers that come in for that lunch, hear from a speaker, uh, hear from the, the library system. And it, again, it was a great way to build those relationships outside of, of the context of the legislative session and for policymakers to become more educated on what the system does, the breadth, the depth of what libraries do. And um, I, I would encourage other systems, if you're not already, to, to do those kinds of similar things. Bring people in, bring policymakers into the library. Uh, I think most of them genuinely have a hunger for knowledge and so they would be delighted to to come visit your local library and just go on a short tour see the different services that are being provided um, and that way they then can be a better advocate for you uh, outside of the four walls of the library thanks Scott do we have any questions from our attendees you can type it in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself um, I will invite you to do that now. As they do that, let me add this um, comment. As you're, as you're considering talking to your policymakers, uh, whether it's email or in person, which, which you need to do both, but um, you know, honesty goes a long, long way in politics. Uh, be an honest broker, and if you if you don't know the answer to something, just say so. It's all right. Uh, and in today's world, I got to be honest with you, uh, just being polite is so needed. And uh, you see it all over the political realm these days, and people aren't polite. Frankly, politicians do not set a good example in that way at all. Many of them don't. And so uh, I would just encourage civility. Uh, I, over the years, I've talked to a lot, a lot of educators, and uh, particularly, you know, a few years ago when, when you had the teacher walk out and all of the tensions that were around that um, that particular issue, I was that was about the time I was leaving the legislature. But um, I told them that you know it's funny in our schools, our kids have a curriculum dealing with bullying. You know, make sure we don't bully each other. Well, as adults, we are the absolute worst. We, we're bad role models. And look no further than Facebook. Get onto Facebook right now. You don't have to dig very deep. And you see the worst in people. And so um, I would just challenge all of us to elevate our game, to be more civil, to be the kind of people we want our kids to be, the kind of people we want them to, to model after. And it's hard. I, I realize it's hard because uh, what people say, whether they be policymakers or other folks, it um, it's challenging not to respond in kind, right? Um, but but I hope that that uh, we can rise above that, and uh, you will. I think you'll be respected uh, by your policymakers more if you can if you can stay on that higher level and higher plane. That's great advice, especially in our crazy world right now. Yeah. Um, Lisa asks, as a former legislator and current chamber CEO, for our participants that don't currently have legislative relationships and community partnerships, what piece of simple advice would you give to find the courage to get started? Yeah, so um, look for, I, I just give them a call. Give them a call, shoot them an email and uh, make that introduction and and we talked we we didn't get too deep into this i realized uh networking for some people is um odd and awkward and uncomfortable 
uh, if you're not an extrovert and, and trying to uh, not be the, the flower wall kind of thing, right? But um, uh, you, you can't be timid. You need to get out there and be uh, politely aggressive and, and build those relationships. So uh, just reaching out to your policymaker, and uh, I think Courtney asked about you know, inviting somebody to the library for programming. I kind of already answered that, but definitely. Um, they can't come every week, so don't get, you know, don't be surprised if they can't come to every little program you have, but be strategic in what you would invite them to. Um, maybe, heck, you know, the chambers are known for ribbon cuttings, and so make sure that your policymakers are invited to a grand opening of, of a new program you have, um, just so they can begin to get to know you and get to know what you do. Um, so, uh, I think most of them will be very responsive to um, to you reaching out and be very interested in in learning more what you do. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much for your time. And um, if it's all right with you, I'll share your contact information with our attendees so they can follow up if they have any other questions or want to pick your brain a little further on any of the topics we discussed today or any that we missed. So thank you again for all you do for libraries and Norman in particular. And um, we know where to find you. So <laughs> we will be in touch. But thank you again for joining us today. My pleasure, and I'd be happy to uh, chat with anybody on down the road, so feel free to, uh, to reach out. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Scott. All right. So moving right along, um, Aiden, you're up next. Thank you so much. And Scott, um, I was so happy for him to be in front of me because he does have that banking relationship as well, as well as being a legislator. Uh, he, for a long time, worked in the financial industry. So um, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about actually does have a bit of a financial uh, slant to it. So let's get started. I'm going to be speaking about establishing and growing your partnerships. So uh, on the next slide, there we go. Uh, so I have had the pleasure of being um, involved with the Smart Investing at Your Library grant three times, which has totaled just about 12 years worth of financial literacy programming uh, that I've directly interacted with. And I've also had some fabulous mentors along the way who really introduced this concept to me of relationship being like a bank account. So I just wanted to talk about this for a moment. So if you are new to this uh, concept of building partnerships, and maybe that's not the most comfortable thing for you to do, just throwing yourself out there and, and going up and shaking hands and or bumping elbows, whatever we do uh, <laughs> these days. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about thinking of your relationships like a bank account. So as you know, when you open up a bank account, you have to put money in. Uh, there, you start with a zero balance, unless there's some sort of promotion, you know, you get $25 or something to start your new account. So when you open up that account, you really are starting with zero. And that's the same when you meet a brand new person. You're starting from zero. And you need to think about it both being on equal footing. So when I think about making a deposit, into my bank. I am adding money. Um, so you can also think of that as when I start a new relationship or when I'm wanting to grow a new relationship, I need to be able to put something in. I need to invest in that relationship. And that is that money could be things like goodwill, trust, like Scott mentioned, uh, reliability. Those are all things that you can add to a relationship when you're starting, starting out. And we all know what might happen if we try and make a withdrawal from our account before we have money in the bank. So what's going to happen? You're, a couple of things might happen. You might get declined just outright. So you make the ask and nope, sorry, don't know you, don't know your organization, not willing to put myself out there for you. I tried to make a withdrawal before I had money in the bank. OK, now some modern accounts, they will allow you to withdraw 
but you have to pay it back. It's sort of a loan. Um, same thing with a credit card. You know, if I'm swiping my credit card, um, I'm not necessarily spending my money, I'm getting an advance on it. So if something were to happen and I needed to reach out to someone, they might be willing to give me that loan. OK, maybe, oh, I know it's the library. They're a trusted organization in my community. I'm willing to extend a little bit of that goodwill, but that's only going to go so far. So when you think about building a relationship and just like Scott mentioned about building it outside of those four months that are super busy when they're actually in session, same thing. It's best to try and build that relationship before there's an actual need for it. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. I think I got the point across there. And like Kelly said before, feel free to put questions in the chat. We've got people that are monitoring that. So if you have questions during any of this, please feel free to ask. This is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it's from Alice in Wonderland. And she's uh, looking up and, at the Cheshire cat in the big tree. And she's saying, well, what road do I take? And he says, well, where are you going? She says, I don't know. Well, then it doesn't matter what road you take. Uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road is going to get you there. So um, if you had unlimited time and resources, it doesn't really matter what road you take. But for a lot of us, sometimes uh, we are time driven. We are project driven. Uh, we have certain objectives or goals that we need to accomplish. So we really do need a, a road map before we start on our journey. So when we think about a new project, a need, or an idea, that's a perfect time to think about perhaps a new partnership. Or, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, maybe reinvigorating an existing partnership. So when we think about what we want to accomplish, you also need to think, what are we missing that can make this successful. So perhaps it's something like um, we don't currently reach that audience. And so we need to find someone who's already reaching that audience. Maybe we have a wonderful idea, but we're, we are not the subject matter experts ourselves. So we're missing that piece to make the program successful. Um, perhaps you can think about what is someone else missing? What can you offer? A lot of times the library can offer credibility. We are a trusted institution. Um, you can offer that trust, the reliability. You can offer um, a built-in audience sometimes. Maybe someone else has a wonderful idea or a project, but their particular organization doesn't see the type of uh, traffic, either online, customer base, that sort of thing. So you really need to think about not just what are all the things we can throw at this, but is there anything missing um, to complete that puzzle? And then I want to challenge you, which you're going to do later in some of these exercises uh, that my co-presenters are going to lead you through. But before you start down that path of thinking about, here's all the partnerships and all the great new people that I want to join with, you really have to know what is the mission of your organization or of what are the values of that project that you're trying to get implemented. And spending some time up front and defining these things, they're only going to help you as you go on down further in the road. So you see this little graphic, which I love. Um, we have all of these arrows pointing in, in one direction. Um, but if we try and make a partnership with someone whose values don't align with us, it's, it's going to weaken the structure of what you're trying to build. It's not all going to interconnect. But when we are all moving in the same direction, all of our values, our mission is in alignment, um, then we only make each other stronger with a partnership. We don't ever want to add a weakness um, by trying to make something fit that truly we just don't have our same uh, values or mission in alignment. And then I spent a little bit of time earlier talking about a target audience. Um, if you are not trying to reach the same audience, we're never going to be successful. We're going to completely miss the mark. Um, so you want to think about 
Who is already reaching out to that audience? Who is being successful at reaching out to that audience? Sometimes it's easier if you can partner with someone who has an established relationship and to join with them so that you can take advantage of who they are already reaching and doing well. So a lot of times when we think about library programs, um, we think about, oh, it has to be either in the library or the library needs to be the one running the whole show. Well, there might be other organizations that already have clients that are uh, reaching that audience successfully, and it might be easier to start out and be a part of a presentation or part of um, a project that they are already doing so that you can introduce yourself to that audience. They get to know you over time. Instead of trying to compete or maybe uh, draw in the same exact audience and, and offering um, you know, just an overload of things that are happening. A lot of times we need to think about um, transportation or access. So for example, if I'm in uh, a setting where maybe I'm on a bus stop or I'm not on a bus stop, if, if the people that I'm trying to reach already are having um, a difficult time reaching one organization, let's say a social service agency, um, if I already have to arrange for childcare, I already have to get myself to a certain place, um, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to offer something on the opposite side of town where, again, my client base might have to uh, arrange for transportation, uh, you know, pay a babysitter, something like that. So if I can piggyback on something that's already happening, I'm going to save time uh, for the audience and then I'm going to actually be able to build more of an audience so that if I do decide I want to have something hosted all on my own, I'm going to be more successful because I've already introduced myself uh, with a trusted partner. And then this is something I'm sure we've all had happen to us if we have been involved in programming or big projects. So I really want to emphasize that the partnership needs to happen not just with that individual that you meet at the ribbon cutting or that you meet at, um, you know, oh, my neighbor happens to work for this organization. We should partner. We should do something great. Well, Somewhere down the line, you might have a couple of missed calls, maybe some emails don't go answered right away, and you're thinking, what is up? What is going on? Um, and you dig a little further and you realize, oh, we're so sorry, that person no longer works here. Oh, we're so sorry, they've been moved to a different division. Um, and where they have gone, there isn't another person that can readily step in. Um, you know, worst case scenario, your publicity's already gone out, you've already got a program happening, and then all of a sudden you have to scramble and say, oh my gosh, you know, we were going to partner with this organization, but that person is no longer there, so we can't do this. So I would always encourage not only just to make that relationship personal with that person, but also get to know that organization. Make sure their bosses are aware of the project. Make sure that, you know, if something were to happen to my partner tomorrow, um, is there someone in that organization, have they thought about that, that could step in? You know, maybe they get sick, maybe something happens. I'd hate to cancel a program or an event or a big project um, because someone else wasn't prepared uh, to be able to step in. And this is a good point for ourselves as well. If something were to happen to you tomorrow and you've committed to this ongoing partnership with another organization, could someone in your library system step in and cover for you? So those are just some things to think about. We, we want to represent the library, but we have to make sure that the library um, is able to cover what we are setting out to accomplish as well. 
And Aiden, I just wanted to jump in and say, I really love that point because it ties into what you said earlier about knowing what the mission is of your organization and the other organization. Because if that individual steps away, you have that backing of, well, we are working together because our organization's missions are moving forward together. So I think that's a really great added layer. Yes, and absolutely. A definite way to show value uh, for both organizations. So, and Scott mentioned this a little bit too, but getting to know uh, your new relationship, your new partner, um, making sure that you have ongoing communication, uh, not just in the moment of need, but really take the time to figure out um, how often do you need to check in with this partner? Is this someone um, you know that's fairly new to this project or new to this type of work? And maybe you need to spend a little bit more time nurturing that. Or maybe, oh, they've got this, we've done this before. I know that I can just shoot a quick email over to this person and they're gonna handle it. Um, spend some time and figure out what's the best way to communicate with this person with this person or within this organization. Some people prefer email, that's wonderful. Sometimes people get buried in their emails and you think, oh, I really was so excited. I thought this was gonna be a great partnership, but I can never get an email response from them. In a very nice and polite way without shaming that person, find a way to say, you know, I get it, we all get a ton of emails. What's the best way for me to get something on your radar uh, so it can get addressed quickly? I don't wanna spend my time shooting a bunch of emails every single day if my results are nothing. I, you know, I don't wanna repeat the same behavior because that's gonna equal the same results. Um, so maybe it's a quick text message, maybe it's a voicemail, um, I don't know, but that's something that you guys can work out, um, especially if you are trying to partner with someone who is truly very busy and has a lot of things uh, going on. And it's also okay to say, you know, is there someone that maybe has a little bit more uh, time that they can devote to this um, that you want to handle this part of our project? Um, so just because you started the relationship with someone, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the one that's going to be doing all of the, the uh, nuts and bolts work. So maybe they're the big picture, the big idea person, but maybe they have someone under them that really is going to handle scheduling the calls, getting you the paperwork that you need, taking care of all of those details. Um, it's okay to ask if there's a person like that um, so that you're not waiting on those types of answers. And then I do want to just talk a little bit about um, this concept, more than a handshake. Oh, you know, that sounds great. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. So we have a verbal agreement. Well, what's that really worth? <laughs> Um, when you have spent time building this relationship and you've said, okay, we're going to do this big event, this project, this partnership, this program, whatever it is that you're trying to do, um, if it's really worth doing, I would say it's worth talking about the details of it and it's worth getting it nailed down in some way, shape or form. Now, if you work for an organization that already has a presenter agreement, some sort of contract that you sign, um, that's great. And spend some time getting to uh, be familiar with the ins and outs of that paperwork and make sure that your partner that you're wanting to work with um, has that. Now, I recognize that not every library has some of these forms already. Um, maybe you don't have access to a legal department to help you work with your contracts or to define all of this. Um, kind of the very basics that I would recommend is spending time and talk about the purpose. What is the purpose of this uh, project or this partnership or this program, whatever it is, our idea, what's the purpose of it? Um, and then what am I going to do and what is my partner going to do? So spend some time thinking about what can I contribute as the library? What will I agree to? And then my partner, what are they going to agree to? When does this start? 
When does it end? Is there an ongoing date? And then terms, is someone gonna get paid? Um, are you paying a presenter? Um, things like that. So when uh, will they get paid? How does that work? Do I write the check? Does my business office write the check? Uh, how often can those checks even happen? So making sure that people understand that so that you don't run into those difficulties down the road. And then think about what is actually being created. Are we working together to create something new, new content, new lessons, uh, things like that? Who owns that content after your program is ended? Can the library just pick another partner and use that same information that we created? Can that partner use that information and go and partner with another library system? Is that okay? Um, I'm certainly not here to give you legal advice, but I would just say it's worth thinking about, especially when we're creating shared PowerPoints and we're not all in the same organization. Who owns the content? How are changes going to be made to our program? Think about that. Can I just say at any time that, oh, I changed my mind, we're only gonna do four and not six programs? Or could I write into our agreement that any changes will be presented 30 days in advance and that we would both agree on them before they're implemented. Things to think about. Getting a firm date and getting a signature by someone who is a decision maker. So just like before, um, if I were to leave tomorrow, uh, who could fill in for me? Well, you know, I never agreed to do that. It, you know, someone could say, well, actually, we have a signed agreement with your um, organization. So is there someone else that could help uh, provide these resources? Um, and then, then on the next slide, and I'm going to end with this. Just like it's so important when you establish your relationship, you got to put money in the bank before um, you know, you can make withdrawals, you wanna keep adding uh, deposits into that bank. It is so important. Don't go for long periods of time and not check your balance. It is so important when you think about what do I have uh, in the realm of partnerships? Partnerships are organic and they need to be fed as they go along. If you go six months, and never check back with a person, and then all of a sudden you want all of these things from them, it's really like starting from scratch. Um, you really need to take the time, check in with those partners. So maybe right now your library isn't open fully. That doesn't stop you from picking up the phone, checking in with a partner, saying, hey, how are you guys doing? What, what are you guys doing? Is there anything um, you know, that we can help you with? Or here are the things the library is currently doing, even though uh, we're not open for these giant programs right now, here are some things we're doing in the digital world. Would you be interested in you know, changing some of our uh, regular partnership? You really want to also spread the wealth. Um, you know, we, if you're involved in financial uh, services at all, a lot of advice says diversify. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, maybe I trip and fall and I break all my eggs. Uh, that's certainly a possibility, right? So if you say, well, anytime I do a program about X or a partnership about, you know, whatever it is, we're going to use this one person and we use that one person over and over and over. They could get burnout. They could um, say, well, you know, our, our mission has changed. And then all of a sudden you have no partner uh, in that realm. So it is so important, you know, don't just say, oh yeah, if I do a, um, you know, this type of program, I only use this type of person. Um, it's really important to continuously scan your environment, know the new partners that are popping up, um, check in regularly with your existing partners, and truly think about, you know, how diversified is my partnership? And I know Kelly's got some exercises that are going to um, help with that. And I would just say in this new Zoom environment, in our virtual world, um, 
we really have focused a lot in the past on local partnerships, local communities. And I think what we're finding is that now in a digital age, sometimes it's a little bit easier to look outside of your um, sort of bubble in your own community. And you can have access to uh, speakers that are more diverse. They don't have to worry about travel. Um, they're not investing time, you know, to travel from one place to another. You don't necessarily have to feed everybody. Um, you know, you don't have to put them up in a hotel overnight. And there, there are some people um, that would be willing, you know, that are that are. Um, well known in certain fields that could come on and just do a brief even an introduction or say hello that sort of thing so i would encourage people uh to look large and um to try to to try to um, expand so um i'm gonna leave it there and i'd love to take some questions um so again this is just a, a brief introduction on how you can start those partnerships and how you should continue to grow those partnerships as well aiden we have a question in the chat um, from seda she asks if you have a partnership that was established before you arrived and you are new um, what do you suggest for someone taking on a new regular community partner um, there are a few others but maybe those first two sure so thanks for the question that's really great so if there is an established relationship that you are coming into as new you still need to build that relationship. Um, maybe they think, oh yeah, I know what the library does. I know what the library is all about. Um, you know, actually being new is a really great advantage because it gives you the opportunity to ask a lot of questions. You don't have to assume anything. Um, so that's an opportunity for you to say, you know, I'm so new, tell me more about your organization. I'd love to know more about it. Um, and because you are new to the partnership, just because this is how we did something in the past, it doesn't mean it has to continue that way. What's something unique about you? Maybe you have a slightly different skill set than the person who was managing that relationship before. Is there something new that you can offer or bring to that partnership? I think that's important as well. Um, let's see. And then she says, how do you balance your own new ideas for what partnerships can look like versus what partners did in the past? That's a great question. Um, so spending some time and talking through those ideas, maybe this is something that that partner can pivot um, to be able to accommodate, or maybe it's something that, you know, you can look for a different partner. Um, New ideas are always welcome. I think they're they're great. You want to shake things up every once in a while um, so you can offer new things or draw in a new audience. Um, so I would just say, you know, continue to put yourself out there, continue to focus on those uh, new relationships. And then for nurturing the other, the existing ones, I think that's a great idea as well. And, and truly think about, you know, what do I, um, what do I have to offer that is different? And then how, how can you avoid burning bridges? Sure. So the, value that the library brings uh, stays the same. And we can be a trusted uh, individual or partner or organization. We can continue to provide support and um, resources to a partner without actually doing a program. So maybe I need to support their employees. Um, maybe it's time for a break too. Um, you know, you really have to evaluate what are the goals with, um, you know, what does my supervisor think when they brought me on to be in this position? What are the goals um, of the library? Have they changed any? Um, and I'm going to actually segue into this. Do you have tips on establishing and maintaining partnerships in the area of or in the era of COVID-19? Um, I think establishing partnerships or maintaining partnerships, it all comes down to communication. 
So if you have existing partnerships, I think this is the perfect time where you can say, you know, let's think about this. Have you changed anything about the way you're currently doing business? How are you reaching your customers? Is there um, a new target audience that you're trying to reach? Um, you know, things like that. And then for building a relationship, you know, it's, it's hard. You can't necessarily go out and visit someone in person, but you could write an email and invite them to do um, a Skype, you know, let's grab a cup of virtual coffee and just tell me, you know, what are the things keeping you up at night? What are the things concerning you uh, with your business or with your organization? And, you know, how are those things new? And what can I, in my library role, do to help support you with those new concerns? Um, you know, I think libraries have done an amazing job uh, during this digital age of providing digital programming, doing all sorts of um, curated web resources. I think we've um, done just an amazing job promoting our digital collections, our electronic resources. Not every organization is as set up or as nimble um, to be able to have a Zoom license or Big Blue Button or Skype or whatever it is. Um, you know, we are a fairly tech savvy group and maybe your partner organizations, they don't really know how to reach their audience. So um, that's something that I think uh, Oklahoma libraries have done a fantastic job on and is something that we can help um, these existing uh, partners figure out. Um, even just how to use Zoom. I know. Uh, we were speaking last night with someone who discovered that none of his employees had laptops that had microphones or cameras on them. So even providing uh, some sort of advice for technology of what's going to work well to help them reach their partners. Hey, Aiden, I've got a oh, question yeah. for you. Sure. Stand. So you, you mentioned going through and, and establishing this relationship, your organization, another partner organization. That's going really great. Now you want to take that and you want to scale it beyond. Let's say it's you know across the city, across multiple cities. What's the best way to take what you've got between two and scale it to four, six, eight, ten? Sure. So um, when you're thinking about that scalability, you need to think about does my audience um, exist in these other areas? Um, is there someone you know, sometimes organizations are, oh, I don't want to say territorial, but they have specific regions that they are able to work within. So does the organization that you're currently working with, do they have that ability to go beyond? Um, or is that another person that you need to meet and be introduced to? So perhaps my local um, group that I'm working with, they have a county jurisdiction. Well, maybe I want to take this for three counties. So then I would say, you know, who are the, the other two people that are responsible for those other two counties? Is that somebody, um, you know, that we can set up a meeting with and we can talk about, you know, is this a need that they see? Um, or uh, do I have the time and the resources to devote to that? Do I need to bring other people in with me to help support uh, that larger piece? And then, of course, um, you know, just what's the value that you're going to bring to that um, larger piece? And how can it benefit, um, you know, from being larger? Do you reach a wider audience? Do you share, um, you know, with that wider audience some benefit that they're currently not receiving uh, that it would be beneficial for them to do? I have a question. Um, it's kind of a comment, but um, leading into a question of talking about saying goodbye to partners. And um, sometimes, you know, that has to happen and not necessarily burning bridges, but you need to move on um, because either your strategic plan has changed or you did revamp your mission. Um, I think one, my comment is, I think the MOU and the agreement is a really great way to revisit that and not get caught in that cycle of we've been doing this forever and now how do we get out of it? Um, but having something that you can revisit in a way to not only update, you know, oh, we need new contacts or we want to 
you know, revamp this service, but as a way to say, are we still meeting this need and is this still relevant? Um, and is it still moving us both forward? So I think that's another really great tool to use. Um, but do you have any other advice on, you know, either recognizing it's time to move on? And if so, how do you do that with grace? And I know you touched on that a little bit with, you can still offer resources and you're, but you know, maybe having that breakup conversation with your partner. Sure. Um, you know, there's there's some things to look at there. So if I have a new strategic plan or if I have a new direction that my uh, organization is wanting me to move in, it's OK to say that um, it's OK to say that with civility. Um, I did have a, an experience one time where we had been doing programming uh, with a certain partner. Um, and then for whatever reason, they were tasked with becoming revenue generators. So they needed to charge uh, participants for materials, for um, all kinds of things. And um, we really had to sit down and talk about and revisit the fact that as the public library, um, that was not in alignment with how we were operating. We did not want to have cost as a barrier for people to attend. Um, I think as long as you are honest, and this is not a criticism of that organization or of your organization, but it is just a goal. And if, especially uh, in the nonprofit world, we tend to lead with our hearts sometimes and we think, oh, it's a breakup. Well, it's really not, it's just a refocus of where we're putting our energy. It doesn't mean that um, we can't do things in the future, but for right now, uh, the direction that my organization needs me to go in um, is, is in this direction. And I have loved working uh, so closely with you. And I actually wanted to know, did you have any suggestions for me? Do you know of any groups or partners um, that I might explore? because this is a new direction that I'm being asked to go. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to um, support this program uh, going forward. And I've had an absolute, you know, wonderful time working with you guys on this. And I'd love to work with you guys in the future. Um, but for right now, for this quarter or for this uh, part of the year, uh, these are the goals that my organization has. And I was just wondering if there are any partners that you could recommend. Um, Sometimes they're going to want to, you know, take some time to think about it. That's okay. But I think as long as you're honest, um, you don't make it personal. Um, in, and when I say personal, I, I don't mean that you want to just be, you know, cut and dry and business like. But again, if you've started out your relationship talking about your alignment of your mission, the alignment of the goal, um, you know, it's it's okay to celebrate our successes that we've reached um, during this time or to say, you know, this really uh, just isn't meeting the need that we thought it would uh, through no fault of, you know, anybody. And we, we have to try this new direction. Um, so these are the things we're going to be focusing on. If that's something that you think you can also focus on in the future, that's great. If it's not the right time for you, that's okay too. Um, and I would just do it with kindness and um, just go from there. Any other questions from our participants? I will say it's important to practice. Anytime you have a difficult conversation, um, that you're going to have with someone, whether that's a, you know, we're, we're moving in a different direction or, or things like that. It's so important to practice. Um, I write down the key points that I want to make. I will frequently call someone or even just say it out loud uh, in a mirror and, and make sure that I am coming across as uh, genuine and that I don't get flustered in what I'm trying to say. Um, so just practicing that skill of being uh, a good partner. 
Oh, okay. Rebecca says, any tips for transferring the balance when moving to a new position to set your replacement up for success? Sure. So if I know that I am moving on to a new community or a new um, project, and maybe let's say Kelly or Chris is going to be taking over for me, I am going to do my best to set them up for success. I'm going to do a, a introduction via email. I'm going to have us all get together on a call if we can't meet in person. And I'm going to really spend some time making sure my partner knows all the wonderful reasons why Chris or Kelly um, are still part of a trusted team, uh, what experiences they have, what they can bring to the table that's new. Um, you know, just assuring the partner that, you know, I'm still with the organization. If there's any questions, um, I'm still here as a resource for this person. This project is still super important to me and I want to make sure it's a success. Um, and that's why I've brought on these two new people uh, to help with that. So I, I feel confident that they're in good hands. And, you know, for the first three months of this partnership, I'm going to have a, a check-in, you know, every couple of weeks with these people and just make sure that things are on track. So um, those are some things that I would do. Just have that communication, um, share some things about them, and make sure that they understand uh, what all has been in place beforehand. What are some places where it's fine to make changes? What are some things that we need to continue doing? Any last questions? All right, let's take a quick break. Um, since it is virtual, I do want to make sure we get time to stretch our legs and get some steps in. So um, let's reconvene at 1025. Our next speaker is logging in at 1030. So um, that'll give us a few minutes to answer any last questions or if anybody has thoughts um, about what we've heard so far. Um, but take a quick break and we'll see you back at 1025. All right. I'm glad we got a short break to stretch your legs and refill on coffee and get settled back in. Um, our next presenter this morning I want to introduce um, is Bianca Gordon, and I will read her bio, but I've asked Bianca to be here today because she is involved in a local organization in Norman, and she's everywhere. Um, I think I've met you through lots of different opportunities, Bianca, and um, you're just a great networker, and the work that you do for Bridges is incredible. So um, thanks for being here, and for those of you that don't know Bianca, um, a purposeful networker, Bianca Gordon is the Associate Executive Director for the nonprofit Bridges of Norman Incorporated, where she connects high school students living on their own with jobs and mentors. Gordon oversees the development of the organization's employment program by matching student interests with host businesses. Gordon started Spire Public Relations in 2016 and is a public relations research and writing adjunct professor at the University of Oklahoma. Having graduated from the University of Tulsa with a Bachelor's of Music, Gordon went on to OU and earned a Master's in Mass Communication Management in 2014. She has one daughter, Chesna, and is an insatiable learner who loves spending time with family and playing trivia. Gordon is a sixth generation Oklahoman. Um, and like I said, I've met you a few different times through a few different avenues. So um, you fit right in with our panelists today talking about building relationships and being connected in the community. Um, but first, tell us a little bit more about what Bridges does. I think it's such a unique and awesome organization for those that may not be familiar. Absolutely. So I feel pretty lucky um, to work for such an organization because um, a lot of our students um, are, are inspirational. But to give you a, a general overview, I work with a, a fantastic team of people at Bridges. Stacy Barr Bruce as the executive director, Pam Robeson as our business and communications coordinator, Bailey as our social services coordinator, um, as well as Samantha as our program specialist um, for the SPOT, which is a new day center project that um, Bridges um, essentially oversees. Um, but in short, 
what Bridges does is empower high school students in family crisis to pursue education without obstacles. What that means is that we help high school students who live by themselves with things like connections to jobs, with tutors, with um, being able to get through high school um, by um, essentially just making sure that they get all the educational um, prep work that they need to get done. I talk to them about um, connecting to mentors, but then I also talk to them about what their life looks like after high school. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a college track. It could also be um, trade school or, or a gap year or working for a little bit. Um, but I also find very important to talk to them about entrepreneurship as well. Um, students who have been in situations that are tough at home often are already equipped with everything they need to be entrepreneurs and start their own businesses. Um, so in short, uh, Bridges helps student, students get through high school. That's great. Um, and you wear a lot of different hats in your role. Um, you're involved in the community in lots of different ways, as I mentioned. Um, one of your most successful fundraisers is Bridges Prom, an event that you partner with lots of different organizations on. Um, I know career coaching you mentioned, but that's a huge part of Bridges, um, and that's a built-in opportunity for businesses to connect with your uh, organization. Um, you and I met through a library event and our paths continue to cross. Um, we recently, uh, through Norman Next, had a community service project helping you guys move your office. Um, and, you know, we've helped a few different times there. So my question is twofold. Um, what do you think is important to or why do you, sorry, why do you think it's important to be involved in outside organizations and how does that benefit your organization and the other organizations that you're working with? Sure. So I'll start with the obvious. Um, being involved in outside organizations means that with proactive networking, we get to meet the, the people who could uh, eventually make a difference for Bridges, being that we are a small staff. Um, and making a difference for us means um, use of volunteers, means use of funding, means use of space sometimes when we need a larger space. Um, and so, of course, the obvious is um, being in contact with people who can have a mutually beneficial network. Um, that just that makes it that much easier when we have to go for the ask. Um, and that's asking for funding, asking for in-kind and uh, cash donations. And then, uh, as I mentioned, asking for volunteers um, for a small staff who help us, us with big projects. In the end, um, of course, it helps our students because then we can focus on them a little bit better. Um, the other part of that is um, regarding the, the mentoring and career coaching piece. Um, I've noticed with our students and I notice with people in general that they'll start out telling me um, that they want to go into a certain career field um, or they want to study a certain topic in college. But what I do is I will listen to them and often they'll tell me one thing, but then just by observation, I can tell that they may be better at a different career path. Um, and some are true to their word and know themselves very well and what they tell me that they wanna go into um, is a good choice. Um, so being connected with those community members um, allows me to know that people can be mentors and career coaches in a variety of fields. So that makes it easier for me to match them with our students. Um, also, I think most importantly regarding our organization, youth homelessness looks a lot different than what people think about homelessness. Youth homelessness looks, um, you, you, you can't tell that students are homeless. And so um, a lot of people, when they think about homelessness, they think about street homelessness. They think about people who are unkempt, who are pushing 
stray shopping carts around, people who may have some obvious mental health issues and that look disheveled. Well, high school students, that's the last thing they want to look like, right? Just a normal high school student doesn't want to stand out. So for high school students, what homelessness often looks like is couch surfing, um, or it's staying with a, a, a grandparent for now, staying with a friend for now, um, and they still look presentable. These are students who are involved in extracurricular activities. These are students who continue to work. Um, they deliver our curbside deliveries during this pandemic. Um, we walk up to them and we talk to them at banks. Um, and they are often making sports headlines, but we, we can't tell that these are homeless students. Um, and so what networking and, and being, being sure that we're uh, involved with these outside organizations does is keeps that, uh, and being involved in for, forums like this, is it keeps everyone reminded that there are homeless high school students who indeed need us when it's not so obvious out in the public. Yeah, and that's something that definitely libraries, you know, we never know anybody who walks in our door what they carry with them in their background. So that's mm -hmm. a really great reminder of not to judge a book by its cover for mm -hmm. lack of a <laughs> better <laughs> analogy. Um, <laughs> So I'm curious, Bridges has a small staff. I think you just listed off most of your team. Um, so how do you make sure that you make time for outside commitments? And how do you make sure that you're getting outside of your four walls? Right, so um, personally, I it is difficult to do because again, the nature of what we do is, is work with high school students who are homeless due to no fault of their own. And what homeless due to no fault of their own means is that a parent or guardian is not able to give these students the housing that they need. Um, it means um, if you are looking at a pie chart, the biggest piece of the pie is that their parent or guardian was homeless themselves. Uh, and then just after that, that, that someone in the house has experienced some substance abuse issues. And then after that, that there's um, um, a dangerous person in the home. So then students come to live here and um, they often need us after hours, on the weekends. It's hard to get away and it's really hard to get out of our four walls. Um, so what that looks like for me is that, that at 5 p.m., I have to say, I might get a text uh, after hours about how to wash clothes or some relationship advice or, you know, how to, what they should put on a job application, and that's fine. But at 5 p.m., I also have to tell myself um, there's time, there's, there's time to finish what I'm working on tomorrow. Um, and really looking at what I do is um, when I join those outside organizations and, and really assertively, um, assertively kind of take off one hat and, and put on the other, I'm making myself a better mentor for students and I'm making myself a better mother to my daughter um, by making sure that I continue to develop professionally and personally as well. Um, so that is that's one way um, that we do it. Um, Bridges in general, again, is, is great at um, making those connections in the community. Um, and we often try to, as a small staff, just um, divide and conquer as well. And so um, that's essentially how we make sure that we get outside of our four walls and continue connecting with the community. I'm so glad you mentioned that because my next question was about all the success you've had. Uh, Bridges has been in the news a lot recently for receiving grants and awards and new ventures. Um, you just opened that new space, kind of a hangout space for after school hours. Um, so tell us about kind of how you have stayed connected that way and, and what makes you successful with those, all those new ventures and new applications and awards. 
So in, in terms of the awards and grant application process, a lot of praise goes to um, the executive director, Stacey Barbruce. She has been great at seeking those awards. We're part of the Oklahoma Center for Excellence. Um, and so we often get email notifications about what's uh, available um, in terms of grant funding. Um, United Way is our biggest partner in existence. So I have to shout out the executive director there, um, Darren Wilson and his team um, for um, be allowing us to be an agency among really great agencies in Norman. Um, so on that line of Stacy being great at finding um, grants, we also have to make sure that we're innovative with what that means for our students. Um, and so Stacy thought about how not only we can treat our, our current students, but then how we can prevent homelessness. Um, so in addition to United Way, um, Stacy sent in a grant request through the Thomas Russell Foundation um, to, to address um, essentially hygienic issues with students, um, education support, um, and just general moral support in the form of a day center for anyone between the ages of 14 to 21. So they don't necessarily have to be homeless. They don't necessarily have to have a home uh, where there is an intensive situation. It could be any, any youth, um, within the ages of 14 to 21. And so she successfully won that grant. And so we're grateful for the Thomas Russell Foundation. Um, and we've opened what's called the SPOT, um, which is the day center. It's over in the downtown shopping center, two doors down from CeCe's Pizza on Main Street. Um, and so again, thinking about how we prevent homelessness, there's many studies about after school enrichment activities that keep students out of trouble. And that's one of the uh, benefits of being able to um, go to the to the spot. The other part of that, and it just kind of fell in our lap, is that we're right in the middle of a big fat pandemic that is changing the way that we think about equity in terms of access to technology and What's been great is that, of course, the bond passed so that Norman Public School students could receive laptops from middle school up. But what good is a laptop if you don't have access to the Internet at home? So the, the spot offers free Wi-Fi um, again for anyone. They don't have to come from a, a, a sordid situation. Um, they could be, I used to live out past Lake Thunderbird, and I know th the discussion is, again, access to internet and access to Wi-Fi. So anyone could come to the day center to the spot right now and have access to Wi-Fi. We also offer one lunch per week, um, and we will also begin looking at how we could partner with Norman Public Schools to be a place um, for students to come during those virtual learning days that are now built into the school year. I believe we've got eight in the academic year. Um, we'll provide some tutoring because I can tell um, from a lot of my um, friends on Facebook that a concern is um, having to teach their child algebra or if they've chosen the virtual route. Um, and so, we are actively seeking um, tutors to help support students um, when they do walk into the spot. So again, thanks to the Thomas Russell Foundation for that. Um, that's that's one of the ways we're doing it. Um, really, um, too, there's a cost of case management. So if we can proactively prevent homelessness for youth, we don't have to, um, we essentially are, are saving some costs on time, the time to create charts, the time to do the intakes um, and money, um, which is spent on driving to intakes um, to 
learn whether or not a student would qualify to live at Bridges. So the day center um, is preventative in being able to um, assess those students, youth, I should say, um, and then help them with any um, major, any minor issues, but then also then to transfer them over to Bridges if there's something a little bit more intensive. So, um, and then also when we think about, um, I guess the success of connecting with communities, I have to say, that our students right here living at Bridges are important as an organization as well. Um, so last year I went to a conference on homelessness at NYU and the discussion at that conference as well as many other um, youth homelessness conferences is how can we make sure that young people have agency over their own stories? And um, so I came back determined to make sure that it's not just staff talking to other organizations and being involved in other organizations, um, but that students um, also talk to our volunteers, um, are involved in the City of Norman Youth Council, for example, um, or um, attend some of the talks that have happened at the library, um, the beloved beloved leader series, sorry, uh, over at the uh, West Side Library this year. We've had students sit on those panels. Um, and so I feel that it's important that um, people see those students' faces um, because then you have a direct connection to what you're, to who you're giving to. And um, we can tell their stories all we want but it's always more effective when students are able to tell their stories and it's a little bit more ethical too. They, again, the agency that they have over telling their stories um, allows them to tell as much or as little of it as they'd like to. I love that point. We've talked a lot about that in libraries in terms of turning outward and telling your story and and how that is advocacy. You know, storytelling is also advocacy. Um, and find if you can tell your message, but you can find someone else who's been directly impacted by what you're doing, that's even more powerful and, and authentic, like you said. So I really appreciate your, your point there. Um, are there any questions from our participants for Bianca? Questions or comments, thoughts? I have one question for Bianca. How do sure. you guys go about identifying those that need your services, if it, just in general? We are bit the biggest way that we find out that students need us at Bridges has been um, communication from Norman Public Schools counselors. And um, I am the daughter of two teachers. My mom was a principal for more public schools, and my dad was an AP history teacher for Noble Schools. And teachers are also an integral part of us finding out how we can help students because they kind of like my discussion earlier where I said, I hear what students tell me, but I'm also observing. Teachers also um, are great at observing when a student is low or when something could be going on at home, even without those students um, telling them. And so we often hear from counselors and then we'll hear from teachers. And sometimes, um, very rarely, but sometimes we will have a parent or guardian um, come in and say, I, I need help um, and I'm just not able to either hold on to the house we're in or I'm needing some uh, additional social services support. And while I get that help, I need my students to continue going to high school. Thanks. Sounds like sure. being plugged in is important for everyone, not just you guys. People <laughs> too, encouraging them yes. to be connected. Looks like we've got some people typing. I'll give them a second. Ah, Claudia says that you guys have worked together to provide um, a place to notarize ballots during election season at the spot. That's awesome. Yes, yeah, so you know, you could imagine students this age, students in this pandemic, students who have had 
a background where adults have not made great decisions, where um, providing a place for them to sign up and vote, um, they can do that at the age of 17 and a half, um, would be important to them because they they do have a mature perspective on life, often at an early age, and can vote and should vote. Absolutely. We've got another question from Courtney. How would you recommend librarians approach a conversation with a customer regarding services like the one you offer? If maybe they recognize that they could benefit from this. Sure, that is a good question. How would I recommend that you all approach a conversation with a patron? I, you know, I think you, you could, one, I guess just see where you are. I know some libraries are closed right now, but, uh, and we all are now having conversations. Well, pre-pandemic, <laughs> we were able to do this. But um, in the scenario that you are, see a patron um, and you're near them enough to have a conversation with them, um, I would just mention um, that there are two places now. Um, Bridges that provides residential assistance for high school students and the spot. Um, you might lead with the spot because the spot is for anyone 14 to 21. So that takes away some of the um, unfortunate stigma that does come with, with youth living on their own. Um, so one, I guess I would say just approach it discreetly, but two, um, lead with the spot and that it's a new location for anyone 14 to 21 um, and that within that range you you've got middle schoolers all the way up to students in college um, and you know being able to even start with the conversation um, of our feature as, as simple as wi-fi or just even a place to hang out um, makes that conversation, I think, start a little bit easier. If you do recognize a more intense situation, a more intensive situation, um, then it may be leading them to um, a computer or a laptop and uh, going to our website at bridgesnorman.org and saying, I heard about this organization. Here are a few things that they do. Um, and if you think this is something you need, there's an application on this website as well. Yeah, and Norman is very fortunate to have this organization. And I know that a lot of um, libraries across the state may not have something as specific as this, but I think um, for our participants in the next round of activities we're doing, um, keep that in mind of if that's something that your community experiences and you don't have that resource, you know, who could you talk to about getting something like that started? And Bianca's definitely, I'm sure I'm volunteering her, um, a great resource to talk to about how you could get something like that going um, where you live. Any last questions for Bianca before we move on? And Bianca, I'm gonna drop your contact info in our notes if that's all right with you. Um, so people yeah. can follow up after the fact. Um, with questions or comments. So um, I really want to thank you for your time today and just being such a great advocate for um, the youth in Norman and just being plugged into the community and being a great key player in our uh, city and, and community as a whole. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And it's again, the, the students are a, a huge motivator. Um, I hope that in some way you all are able to come visit us. We are, if Bridges is officially open for office hours between nine and five. Uh, again, you can, uh, sounds like you're going to drop the contact information, but you all feel free to go to our website and you'll see um, how you can become involved as a mentor, as a career coach, um, as a hosting business, if you'd like to host job shadows. Um, and you'll see um, any information that you need regarding um, donations as well. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, thank, thank you all. All right. So next, um, this is a great, I wanted Bianca to be our segue into this next section because we are going to start with uh, mapping relationships. So if you will, if you haven't already, um, go ahead and 
pull up your handout that I believe is called, um, let me see, it's the Engaged Library Toolkit. So you want to get that out and get ready for that. Um, so mapping relationships, I just want to introduce this concept. Um, there are, as Aiden's uh, presentation earlier highlighted, there are countless opportunities to partner in your community. Um, associations, institutions, corporations, nonprofits, um, and sometimes that can be overwhelming. There are so many options that you don't know who to work with. Um, and so sometimes we work with people that it's watering down our mission or uh, it makes us less effective because we're being pulled in so many different directions. So relationship mapping really helps you strategically identify groups and relationships that will move your mission forward like we've discussed today. So regardless of, um, for today's activities, I want you to keep in mind any kind of goal. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be your organization's mission. It could be your strategic plan. It could be a program you're working on. It could be a personal goal, um, but kind of think, keep something like that in the back of your mind to help make this the most relevant to you um, as we go through this. And again, I encourage you to keep an open mind. There are some ideas in here that might be shocking. Um, <laughs> maybe not shocking, that's dramatic, but um, there may be some new ways of thinking thinking. Um, so keep an open mind as we move forward. All right, so I'm going to give you some keys to building relationships and then we're going to dive into our activities. Um, so first, I want you to keep in mind that community relationships are proactive. So that means that the goal is to create a two-way street that positions the library at the center of the community. So how, how do we do that? How do we get to that point? Um, First and foremost, I will stress that it's about getting into the community. If you hadn't picked up on that already today, um, <laughs> that's a theme that you'll see. But this activity outside the library should be encouraged at every level, not just for supervisors, not just for your administrative staff, but staff at every level should be encouraged to go out into their community, build those relationships, um, provide outreach services, whatever that looks like, get outside your four walls. Um, it's okay to get outside of your building. That may be an adjustment if this is something that your organization hasn't done um, in the past and you're used to having everyone in your building all day and suddenly, you know, Susie's gone all the time, that might be an adjustment. So um, making sure your team is on board um, and they understand that because you're not in your physical space doesn't mean you're not still working. Now is a time that we have virtual connections. Like Aiden said, now is the best time to get outside your library without getting outside your library. Um, you can reach anybody basically uh, around the world right now that you can talk to and um, just set up a Zoom call. So take advantage of this time that we have um, to get outside without having to travel, without having to worry about who's staffing your desk. Um, now is a great time to be you know, back up answering phones while, while you're on a Zoom call. Um, if you can't get outside the building, I know that's something that we talk about a lot, especially in public libraries division of, you know, you do have a, a building to run, you have customers to serve that are coming in and you can't just put a sign up that says be back in five. Um, but I do want you to problem solve how to make that happen. This is a worthwhile goal. You've heard it from two of our speakers already um, that this the time that you take to get outside of your building is worthwhile. So do it when you can and then drive that point home where it matters. So if you have a success from going to an event, be sure to share that with the people that matter um, to you, you know, the decision makers of, hey, we built this really great relationship and it resulted from my time at business before hours today. Um, use that as your advocacy piece to allow that to happen more often. You know, what does that look like? Maybe you have more volunteers helping out um, on your public floor. Maybe that it results in more staffing, um, but that can be a piece for you to um, add to your toolkit and say, hey, this really worked, this worked well for us. Um, and then another proactive approach is hiring the right people. Um, 
I think it was in business before hours this morning that Lisa was speaking on behalf of Pioneer and she said, we're in the people business. We're not in the book business. So if you don't like the public, this may not be the job for you. Um, working in the public floor, maybe that's not a good fit. Um, so making sure that if you are in a position where you're able to hire people, that you're proactively recruiting and bringing on board the right folks for your organization to carry that forward. You also want to find the leaders in your community. And what I mean by that is, you know, just observing who in your community makes decisions. Who are the movers and shakers? Who is it that is at the table at all of the meetings you go to? Get to know them. Um, understand what makes them tick and why, um, why they are where they are and how you can get involved. Um, you want to make a concerted effort to discover who's who in your community. Um, you can do that in a variety of ways. Uh, you can, the, the article that I read said you can read the newspaper, which I love, uh, which is still a very valid way of source of information. Um, but you can ask longtime residents, you know, we had a question earlier, if what if you're new? What if you're new to a community? How do you find out who's there? Um, talk to the people that have lived there a long time. Talk with your customers, um, attend civic events get plugged into your chamber calendar or any of those other organizations that we're, you're going to identify here in a minute um, and make sure that you're on the invitation list or that you're registering for those events and then and that you're going that you're showing up once you register um, and then invite those people to your library like scott mentioned for legislators um, invite them into your space give them a tour talk with them about what it is that libraries do that they may not know about and then you really want to create a community-minded culture among your library staff and volunteers. Um, and what that means is you want to learn the names and attend events outside of your library. Again, I uh, can't stress that enough, but um, it's important that your staff are community oriented as well, that even though you're hiring them for maybe a position that's frontward facing on the floor, um, that they're thinking outside their bubble. Um, Lots of people who you hire um, to work in your library also live in the communities that you serve. So they know who owns the grocery store. They know who's at the hardware store. Um, they are already plugged into the community. Um, something that I thought was really interesting was the city of Chicago actually requires their employees to live in the city of Chicago. Um, they think that that ingrains the neighborhood focus in all of their employees and that it really just reinforces that the people that work here and the people that we serve are our neighbors and friends. So I don't know if that's something that is doable for your library, but I thought that was a really interesting piece of um, if that matters to you, maybe you look at, um, you know, including some kind of question in your interviews about that of why do you want to work at this library in particular? What is it about this space that that um, draws you to this job? Support local businesses and institutions. This seems pretty broad, but it's all about that setting up of reciprocal relationships, um, advertising services, and also spending your discretionary funds locally. Um, one example from Chicago Public Library that I love is that um, they employ locally. So they had a grand opening and they um, purchased a cheesecake from a local baker. And ever since then, they now have a ceremonial opening cheesecake at all of their library openings. Um, but they used a local business for that. Um, and that's a mutual beneficial relationship. You know, they get to get their name out there and then you're also sourcing um, locally. Um, thinking about your public information area and just dropping off flyers, really thinking about how you can make that a strategic and meaningful um, space rather than just a bulletin board that's full of a bunch of pieces of paper. Um, make sure those public information areas really um, align with what you're trying to accomplish, um, that it matters and moves you forward. Um, and, you know, if you hear of an event that the library should be at, advertise that as well. Um, if your policies allow and um, just make sure that that's not just a space for noise, but that it's helping um, build your community in new ways. Um, thinking about supporting local businesses and institutions, um, think about supporting large corporate connections also. Um, that's something that maybe is a little different for libraries to think about, but think about what those large organizations um, 
also care about sustainability community service. Um, there's an organization here locally that requires all of their employees to get community service hours. So knowing that whenever you have a large event or some project that needs to be done, you can reach out to those corporations and say, hey, we need you assemble and come over and help us with this project. Um, also consideration of sponsorships of programs. Um, Chicago Public Library actually has a museum passport program that is sponsored by Kraft Foods in Chicago. So you can um, check out a museum pass kit and go to different museums in Chicago. And that's actually sponsored by Kraft. They paid for that. Um, and that's one of those ideas that I think is new to libraries in some ways, but is being done around the country and definitely an option if you're looking for either funding or some kind of uh, support. And then think about how we can support rather than how can we detract from that. Um, if there's a business or something that, um, like Bianca just mentioned, the spot has free Wi-Fi. Think about rather than, oh man, now people are going to the spot for Wi-Fi instead of the library. Think about ways that you can partner. How can you really um, get the word out that, you know, it's not just this one location, but there are multiple places around town that you can have access to Wi-Fi now. Um, another example is that we have our Cleveland County Healthy Living Center being built, um, or I don't know, it's being built, but it's in the works. And they have talked with us since before they even had their blueprints about how do you do successful health programming? Um, what is your audience? What tips do you have for drawing people in? And we've really worked with them from the ground level to talk about successful health programming and now looking at the ways we can partner. So rather than seeing that as competition, it's that cooperation. Discover and contribute to the unique capacities and conditions of the community. Um, that's a fancy way for saying what's special about your community and are you a part of it? Um, thinking about what cultures are reflected in your community and do you represent that in your library as well? I think that's something we're really great at, um, but maybe there are some hidden areas or of your history that you didn't know about or that are coming to light that you need to really shine a spotlight on. Um, and this also is, a staff, an internal piece, employing and training staff to be culturally sensitive and have empathy. Um, so making sure that staff are trained to contribute to the unique community that you serve. Um, do they have the skills and the background and the knowledge to help those customers? Um, are our facilities welcoming? Are we welcoming different diverse populations as they come in? And then what are we doing to help any root issues of you know, chronic issues that we see in our community? How can we get involved to solve those problems? And then the last point before we get into our activity, thanks for bearing with me, um, is investing in libraries to jumpstart community redevelopment efforts. So in Chicago, um, this is maybe unique to their um, situation, but they really looked at building new libraries in hopes that it would bring attention to areas that may have experienced disinvestment. Um, so I know that's a big ask. You can't necessarily just build a library tomorrow, but what you can do is look around and see how you could remodel or, you know, that light that's always been out over your library sign outside, you know, making sure that that's replaced and up to date and that it shows that you're taking care of your building and that others should be taking care of their communities as well. Um, Obviously, you need support of your library administration um, to accomplish this in a lot of cases um, or your municipalities working with them. Um, and Chris, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit and more what you've been doing, um, but it's definitely a collaboration effort. But do you want to share a little bit about the um, remodels that you've done in your facility? The remodels or do you mean more about this the community coalition that we've been working on uh in terms of public health and that stuff because there's two different community projects so which one <laughs> you pick uh well let's talk about the community coalition because I, I think maybe that's an easier one to gain so the city of moore has been working towards <clears throat> larger public health initiatives and there's a lot of city agencies here um everything from a, a food pantry to shelters to uh, the regular health department to the public schools to the, the hospital system the library obviously and we're all trying to achieve this essentially the same things but we're all doing it individually so the goal that we set out was to partner um, with each 
as Aiden talked about earlier with the MOUs and, and, and finding those core things that go between the organizations, find to put those all out on the table, find out some of the bigger um, goals that we want to accomplish, and then come from back at, from there to get us to back where we are on stage one, and then combine everyone together, and then each of us take our own separate pieces so we're not stepping on each other's toes, we're not duplicating efforts, and we, then we have a broader impact because we're, you know there's so many more of us with all of our different segments of the population that we're, you know, that we already have access to, and to be able to share those resources then amongst all these is is, is for the greater impact and good for everyone here. Absolutely. So really maximizing your efforts to re, um, revitalize a part of the community that that needs it. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Chicago Public Library also on this point talks about. Um, how powerful it is for them to build a new library in a new area that's up and coming or maybe not up and coming, maybe that needs some revitalization to be able to say that the first thing we're building in your neighborhood is a library um, and that the library is investing in this community um, and, you know, hopefully seeing business growth around that and, um, and other economic development. All right, so it's activity time. Um, I want you to get your toolkit and you should see a page that says relationships with local associations. Um, I'll show you, it looks like this. It's a little um, ranking sheet. And what I want you to do is think through, well, and we'll do a few of these, but this first page is about associations. So I want you to think about the networks of associations that are in your community. Um, and associations are usually, you know, voluntary networks. Uh, they can be large, small, formal, informal, um, and they're often overlooked. Sometimes we look at nonprofits or we tend to look at big business, but um, what about those smaller associations? Um, so I want you to think about that. And then I want you to look on your next page. You should have another um, ranking system. <laughs> Sorry, I should sh screen share instead of showing you on my tiny camera. But there's also um, a spot for you to rank relationships with local institutions. So thinking about institutions, those are public, private, nonprofit. So that's the difference between those two pages. Um, so at the top, you'll see associations or institutions. But I want you to take a minute to rank, in your opinion, your relationship with these different types of groups. Um, and again, this is why I asked you to keep in mind some kind of goal so you can think about this from either your um, your respective role within your library or your library system as a whole, um, but just be consistent through through um, all of these activities. So think about how your relationship ranks right now and be honest um, on a scale of one to five. So if you have a great relationship with faith faith groups, um, you feel like you partner with them so well, you have some great programs, they're engaged, then circle of five. Um, and if not at all, if you hadn't even thought about faith-based groups, to be honest, um, you can circle a one. And take any notes that would help you explain your answers of why you think you have a great relationship or why not, what's missing there. Um, Think on those keys to building relationships. What's missing? What could get you to that higher ranking? And this will be private, so um, this is. We'll, I'll ask you to share here in a minute. But um, be honest, and no one has to see this other than you. Um, so I'll give you a few minutes to write your thoughts down um, on those two pages, and then we will have you guys share. And if you have any questions or anything, just drop them in the chat or unmute yourself, that's fine too. Kelly, I think I learned a new word. Oh, yeah? On, yeah, on the page 35, um, the second page of examples of associations and organizations. Uh, I know fraternities and fraternal organizations, and I know the word for sororities. I don't think I knew the word sororal organizations. 
That <laughs> is a <laughs> difficult word to say and read for me. <laughs> kind of like the rural juror. Yeah. So, I'm yeah. Like that Aiden, um, because there are examples on page 34 and 35 in case you were um, working ahead. But if you really are stuck on what group in your community could represent that, there are some examples, but certainly um, each community is different. So don't want that to color your, your view, but um, hopefully that will help you think outside the box a little bit. And you might learn something new. Learning something new every day. Every day. Okay, you guys can keep working if you want. Um, I'm going to turn on the whiteboard function so you can write any of your answers um, on this slide. If you click on the, I believe it's, if you click on the hand, um, there is a text option to select. Or if you're really great at freeforming, you can write um, with that little dot, but probably the text box might be more helpful. Um, but in this field somewhere, anywhere, um, and you can see each other's names on there, so hopefully um, you aren't writing on top of one another, but go ahead and write down your thoughts on this activity. What existing partnerships did you identify? Either strong relationships or relationships you're wanting to work on? And you can feel free to elaborate as to why you identified these and how you might engage with them. Um, and you're also welcome to speak up verbally um, if you want to unmute yourself or turn your camera on. Um, we're happy to, to have you share that way as well. Is it working for you guys? <laughs> I see lots of little hands. This is the cutest thing ever. <laughs> We're all moving around. <laughs> yes, and this is Emily from Amigos. Let me know if you need any technical help with the whiteboard. Thanks for being our guinea pigs, guys. I can't get the text to drop in. When I select the uh, tool with the letter thing, and I then I go to drop it on the thing, it's not dropping in. Yeah, and Gail's saying the same thing. Oh, no. Um, so you selected the T for text, and then you had to kind of draw a text box. You click and drag. Um, oh, I see. OK. And then you can start typing. And you type it in. You got it. Oh, good. See it high. Yay, somebody's typing. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you can also feel free to drop it in the chat too if that's easier for you. <laughs>
So I see a note on there of if you are one individual, how do you take this back to your team and really divide and conquer? That's a great question. I think too, knowing your team and their strengths and what they can contribute um, is definitely something that you'll want to know ahead of time um, before you come back and um, say, hey, I have this project and here's how we're gonna move forward. Um, but yes, don't take it all upon yourself. You know, I think you have the backing of an organization behind you. You also have your library association behind you too. Um, to kind of brainstorm how we're gonna move forward on this, but definitely knowing who on your team can help with this um, and making sure that they're plugged in and that they have all the tools they need um, is important. Kelly, I was going to say, um, in, in thinking about Gail's uh, comment in the chat, lack of people or staff, um, that we have many we could grow in terms of partners. I think that's a great example of wanting to be very strategic with how you spend your time. You know, when you think about your entire community, you might think, oh my gosh, there's so many people we could partner with. How do we pick? There's too many. There's only one of me, um, especially if I'm the only person working in my library. Um, that's where you really want to be strategic and think about what is the goal. Not just the goal is to have a partner. The partner helps you achieve your goal. Uh, so think about what am I trying to achieve for my customers or what do, what am I trying to achieve um, in my library and then think about, you know, brainstorm that list of partners that you could work with and then go from there. Also, maybe you're only one employee, but who um, do you have a board? Those board members are probably connected in the community. Do you have a friends of the library organization? I bet those friends are probably have different connections than you might. Um, so enlisting the help of people um, who can help, you know, help take some of the legwork out of um, finding and identifying those partners is a good idea as well. Adding to what Aiden said, you know, having that goal, the end goal of what you want to achieve, if you are only one person, hopefully then you can find others in the community that in other organizations that have that same goal. And then again, if you can divide and conquer amongst them, maybe it's not you having to set every relationship with every person. Everyone takes a segment. And again, it, it, it helps split the work up. And this may be so nuts and bolts, but even thinking about when you have a lack of people or staff, when you identify those partners, invite them to your library. Maybe you meet at the library so you don't have to get outside, you know? Um, so that's something that is kind of a dual purpose of it saves you time from having to go out in the community and also you get to give them a tour of your space at the same time. Let's see, I see on the slide, I like the idea of thinking of the variety of possible partners and using that as a framework to identify people you may not be reaching because you are missing partnerships. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great point. Yeah, if you have a big hole in your uh, reach, that's a, that's a very astute observation that you are probably uh, missing those people. And then you have to decide Okay, so I've identified that I'm missing those people. Are they core to my mission, the group that I am missing? If yes, then you you know a way forward. If they're not, um, then maybe you can have maybe less labor intensive ways uh, to serve them or to meet their needs. But if they're not the, the main goal that you're trying to reach, um, then that's good knowledge to have, um, and you can provide resources if you need to. Yeah. So we're going to move on to the next activity because it builds upon this concept. Um, and continue continue to drop your ideas in the chat. We can revisit that. Um, but. If you look on your next pages in your handout, you should see some bubbles. Um, <laughs> it looks like a little web. It says partnerships with associations and the next page is partnerships with institutions. So this is almost a repeat of what we just did. Um, I want you to 
any of the associations or institutions that you circled a four or five um, on the previous activity. Go ahead and place those in the existing bubbles. And then for any institutions and associations that you had circled one or two or three, maybe you know you could work on um, put into that potential side. And then if there were any that even from this activity that you're like, man, I forgot that this is in my community and we don't do anything with them or we do something great with them. Um, feel free to draw additional bubbles out um, from that chart. But the difference here is that mapping your associations and institutions um, will help you illustrate and connect the dots to strengthen your network. So as somebody just so poignantly mentioned on the slide before, um, it helps you visualize what isn't always seen and it will help you recognize what gaps need to be filled. Um, and it's just another way of kind of branching off of that ranking system that you had initially. Um, so go ahead and take a few minutes to add your existing and potential partners to your um, bubbles. That's the official term. And we've got two questions on there for you, Kelly. Oh, great. I'm at a niche academic library and would like to branch out further into the community, but I'd like to partner with our public library first. Awesome, great start. Uh, I've never been able to make anything stick. With so many public librarians here, what advice would you give someone, namely another library, approaching you for partnerships? That is an awesome question. And I'm sorry that you haven't gotten anything to stick just yet. Um, Heather Thompson volunteers her services, so problem solved. <laughs> no, but I think um, in that instance, my initial thought is, are you reaching out to the right person? And not necessarily are you reaching out to the right person, but um, the person receiving that message may not be the one to with that decision making or that um, ability to create that partnership, or maybe they, maybe they don't feel that way. Um, so again, I think this is a great place to start um, asking public librarians, but um, what do you guys think? Since you are all, are all public librarians. I was going to throw two things out there. One is that this, this group, OLA. Hopefully you would reach out with inside OLA to hopefully get some of those connections. And um, I blanked on my other one. So, yeah. <laughs> it was just so good. Oh, what Aiden said, goals. What are the goals you're looking to accomplish? Because if the person you're reaching out to can't help, like you were saying too, Kelly, with that specific thing, then maybe you need to set a different goal or, or different person or however that looks. Yeah. And I think that's one of the um, pros of, you know, Oklahoma Library Association during the time of COVID, we had our town hall and invited everyone to just think outside the box of how we can support one another. Um, but that was under the guise of COVID, you know, using that um, explicit topic. And so like Chris mentions, maybe you start with that of, hey, I'm wanting to accomplish this. Um, is that something you can help me with? Um, and I think too, also now we're in a different networking kind of world, but um, making sure you're going to events outside of your bubble, especially if you are in an academic library, I love branching out outside of our own professional bubbles. Um, so, you know, attend some PLD meetings, um, you know, I wouldn't tell if you didn't pay the $2, uh, <laughs> but you know, get outside your bubble too. And um, I encourage everyone to do that. Think outside the box. And then we have one I, other question from Courtney. Yeah, I was going to say, Courtney um, is asking recommendations on making data-driven decisions, uh, really wanting to make an impact, even if it's a smaller audience. Staff time and resources are valuable, so I don't want to feel like we're not maximizing our time with outreach. Again, I'm going to go back to the goal. Um, and impact doesn't necessarily mean number of people that attended or number of people that you made a connection with. Maybe you didn't have 200 people, maybe you had 20. And so that's obviously a smaller number, but the impact that you were able to make on those 20 people could be life-changing. Um, also, once you have uh, sort of a convert, uh, you know, if you've got that special group of 10 or 15 people who are really into the message that you're trying to share, use them as your recruiters. Um, ask them to bring a friend next time. Or if it's a, um, 
you know, a virtual program, challenge them to share that program information with five of their friends on that same uh, social media platform. So, um, and again, if it's part of the goal um, that you are trying to reach that audience, um, and you are making an impact, I would say there's your data there. You know, do some pre and post evaluation. Ask your attendees, you know, what did you know about this project or service beforehand? Um, did your knowledge increase at all? That Those sorts of questions. Um, so yeah, data does, I think, does not just mean number of people that attended, but um, did, did their knowledge, skills, or abilities increase in any way, shape, or form? That's an impact. I totally agree, and I've always been a um, quality over quantity um, kind of gal, but I think, too, when you talk about data-driven decisions, that's so important, but sometimes you don't always have the data. You want to have it, but you can't. So sometimes just starting without any data or, you know, use use your um, relationships to identify the right areas to do outreach to. But like Aiden mentioned, evaluations, create evaluations, um, either formal or informal, even if that's just walking around talking to people um, saying, hey, how'd you learn about this? Or, hey, what else would you like to see? Or what did you get out of this? Um, but creating your own data, because sometimes you have tools available to you. Maybe your organization works with um, uh, some kind of like project outcome or um, just speaking for Pioneer, we use Orange Boy who collects a lot of data for us, but sometimes you don't. And so just jumping in and um, see, doing a trial run too, um, but gathering your own data can be really helpful. I think Claudia brings up a great point here. Um, an association she doesn't see on, on the little handout is a retired teachers association. They're pretty active and political looking for opportunities to volunteer. So um, Claudia, let's say I don't live in a community uh, where I have my very own Claudia Swisher. Let's say I live in a, a community and I don't even know how to reach the Retired Teachers Association uh, folks. Is there a, a statewide organization? Do they have a Facebook page? How would I go about finding those people? Um, and you know, I think teachers, have wonderful alignment with our goals as well. They're there to um, give, they're there to um, educate, and they're there to make sure that people have what they need. And, and I think that's a wonderful um, idea for getting those people to help volunteer or to share resources as well. Oh, there is a state organization. Uh, so she's going to look for that information. So if you are not currently, uh, if you don't have a bubble filled in for Retired Teachers Association, uh, looks like uh, Claudia is going to find some information for you guys. Awesome. And I noticed Sherry says that um, the relation, their public library relationship with their local academic library is just even amplifying marketing um, programs. And I love that. That's a great place to start. Sometimes it can be that simple. All right. So we're going to move on to community asset mapping. Um, so I hope you filled out your bubbles and that gives you some thoughts um, on how you can strengthen um, and kind of fill those gaps. So this next map um, that we're gonna do, before we get to it, I wanna set you up with a few other ideas. Um, be creative in what the library can contribute. Um, you know, there are obvious contributions. Um, we have books, we have resources, but we have programs, but think beyond that. Um, don't box yourself in. What needs does your community have? Um, so looking outside of our regular um, offerings and what is it that your community is really needing right now and how can you fill those gaps? Um, you have to be willing to say yes and find a way to do it if it's in your mission. <laughs> Wanna say that again. You have to be willing to say yes and find a way to do it if it's in your mission. You don't have to say yes to everything all the time. And we've talked about some really great, great techniques on how to be strategic with that. But if it's something that is important and will move you forward, um, find a way to say yes. Um, and keep in mind the people outside the doors are who is funding you. So if the library isn't useful to them, then we aren't doing our job. So making sure that what we are offering aligns with what people are needing, otherwise we're irrelevant. Um, one example that I'll share again from Chicago was 
um, and Aiden, you'll you'll like this example. Um, the Chicago Public Library created a financial literacy program in branches with large immigrant communities. Um, and they recognize that if Chicago truly wants to be a part of the global economy, then the Chicago Public Library has to be at the forefront of educating people about what it means to be a global citizen. So they started a financial literacy um, program in these communities, and then they were approached later by the Federal Reserve Bank, who had a similar idea. And the library was able to say, hey, we're already actually doing this and you want to get on board and help. Um, and so now their Money Smart program is being copied by uh, Federal Reserve Banks in other parts of the country. And how awesome is that? Um, so again, finding that way to um, say yes and getting out there. Um, making the community or sorry, making the library building a community center. And this is something I think we do a really great job at, but even thinking beyond that. So we have meeting spaces. Um, we have you know, meeting rooms and um, our space is flexible, but having um, space that people can really feel ownership of. So whether that's setting up a room that is flexible for people um, to set up in a way that suits their needs for their meetings. So thinking about, is your furniture bolted to the ground or can you have, um, you know, tables and chairs that are easily moved aside for different types of events? Um, but by giving them that ownership, the library becomes a vital part of the community life. Um, and also looking at policies. What policies do you have? Um, are they conflicting with what people are asking for? Are you constantly having to say, no, we don't do that? Um, think about why that is. And maybe there's a great reason for it. Or maybe it's something that's out of date because you know our communities are always changing. So um, looking at how we can meet those needs and, and adapt. Um, and then also highlighting your collection and services with everything you do. So not to minimize the fact that we have books and resources, um, but finding a way to be intentional about sharing that. Um, and we are doing a lot of unique and creative things in the library. We're polling places. Um, we are summer feeding sites, but every single thing that we do should tie back to our services and what we have to offer. So if you are a polling place, do you have checkouts strategically placed where people are waiting in line and can check out um, a, a, from a display? Um, are you having displays where you are um, feeding people? so they can readily check out. Um, but just every program and every single thing that we do should have a clear and direct tie back to library resources, um, even if it's something as simple as we have books on that. So making sure, again, that it's moving you forward. And I was just gonna say for the academic uh, libraries that have commented, <clears throat> I think that's a really great opportunity. What can the public do in your space? So do I have to be a student? Do I have to be an alumni? Can I visit? Um, how easy is it for me to visit you? Um, so even on my website uh, for my academic library, is there a space on the website that's geared not just for students, but for the public or for alumni? So is it easy for me to figure out, let's say I wanted to go and visit this um, library, how would I even do that? Do I? Um, know how to park? Do I need to, um, you know, be an alumni, that sort of thing. And then also, if you're wanting to offer some things for the public, I think your alumni groups are a wonderful uh, place to start. There are so many of our individual colleges and programs that have their own alumni groups, um, like on Facebook. So you could even post on that Facebook page. Um, you know, you remember all the time you used to spend in the library? Well, now we're offering this for you. Um, so that's another place um, where you could go and uh, sort of drum up business. Um, if, if the partnership with the public library uh, isn't gonna happen just right away, how can you reach out to the public? Um, you know, students have families and, you know, students bring your family along, bring your grown up, bring your, um, you know, a family member or a neighbor to a certain event or a program. So those are ways as well. Love that. Thanks, Aiden. All right. So your next page on your handout is your community asset map. 
And I know that it seems like we're maybe having you redo this a couple times, but that's on purpose. It's for you to refine um, and filter down your partnerships even more. But on this page, um, what I want you to do is think about not of what the library has to offer, but what does your community have to offer? So taking the library out of it, um, I want you to fill in in these boxes what um, associations your community has um, and institutions, which you've already done, but think about your individuals. Who do you have in your community that is unique to your space? Um, and on the page following that are some examples if you need some help um, brainstorming. But um, again, every community is different and unique. Um, what physical spaces does your community have in terms of if you aren't if the library is closed, where can you go? Um, where can people gather? Um, what stories does your community have? Do you have any kind of interesting history there? And your local economy, what is unique about your community? Um, do you have an Air Force base nearby? Um, do you have a unique, I don't know, banking system? I don't know, um, <laughs> I'm running out of examples. But um, take a few moments to write down in each of those boxes what's unique about your community. And as you're writing these down, you can also share in the chat if you have anything that is um, unique and that you're excited about. And then as you continue to work on that, on the next page or the next, oh, and somebody is located right off of the original Route 66. That's awesome. So many possibilities for cool events and um, programs there. That's neat. So as you're thinking about what your community has to offer, we're gonna flip the script again, and you can think about then what your library has to offer. And I love, um, if you recreate this in your communities, I love this because it forces you to think outside of your own space first um, about what other people have to offer. And then it gives you a fresh perspective, I think, of what the library has to offer. So you'll see on here, now you have a space to write out what is unique to your library in terms of personnel. Um, what special skills and talents do people on your team have? What kind of space and facilities do you have? What's unique about your library and how that relates to the community? What materials and equipment do you have? Expertise? constituents, networks of connections, and economic power. And again, on that next page, there's an example of what that could look like. So think about what's unique to your library. And again, drop it in the chat if there's something that you wanna share with everyone that's super cool about your space. I love all the ideas being shared in the chat. That's great. Ooh, and the Route66Alliance.org. Awesome resource. Okay. As you continue to type in the chat, 
Um, so this is the final product. So this is where we tie all those pieces together, and this is what we're looking for at the very end result. So all of those activities are just leading up to this page in your packet. Um, and you'll notice that all of these boxes, they're blank, first of all, because you might have some uh, stories or histories or something that um, applies to your um, community that's more important or that you value or that really moves your mission forward. So it's not to include every single possibility necessarily, although you could print off as many of these as you wanted. Um, but you'll notice that all of those boxes have arrows pointing to and from. Um, so at the end of the day, all of these activities that you have just participated in should point to those two-way streets and those two-way um, relationships that can help move you forward. So how many of you often feel like the library is always offering their assets to the community? You're always giving, 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 and maybe they're not giving anything in return. Or vice versa, how many of you feel like the community is always offering their assets to the library and you feel like, oh man, I feel bad that you keep donating and I don't really have anything to give. Probably not because you're all amazing. But um, <laughs> the end goal is to, again, have that two-way street, that mutually beneficial partnership. Um, so in this box and on this page, you can write um, a relationship that you have or you know that you're continuing to build um and make notes and there is an example on the next page again of what that could look like and i love that um those examples in terms of you know looking at your school if sometimes we support our schools a whole lot and how can they um, help in return um and you know getting people to come to the library or utilize library resources digitally um so this is kind of the the crown jewel if you will of um, the activities that we went through today. And we do have our next speaker on the line, but before we move on to hearing from Andrea, um, any thoughts or revelations or um, questions or anything that's come up during our conversation about relationship mapping? Hopefully this is useful and something that um, by going through today, you can take back to your teams. You could even lead this activity with community members outside of the library to help them think about how the library is important too. asking them, um, you know, what the library could do for you. I know Chris has gone through a Harwood, Harwood Institute training that is very similar to that. Um, this is much less time consuming than that training, I think, but. I'm loving all of the people sharing ideas with each other. Um, the contact information that's in that public chat, I think is going to be priceless for some of you. Um, taking advantage of the idea of, um, you know, just reaching out and, and helping each other. Um, Courtney says, I've never considered religious organizations. I think it's ingrained in many public librarians to be neutral on that front. I think that that is um, a really good example of the public. Um, and you think about a, a religious organization, how do they reach their um, congregations? Do they have a newsletter, a bulletin? Um, you know, if we needed to get something out very quickly, um, is there a local ministerial alliance that you could send one email to and all of those people could then reach all of their uh, faith-based uh, people that attend their services? So I think, um, there's the idea of, you know, this is a religious organization. I don't want to be seen as promoting one religion over another. But I think if you think about um, organizations like the Ministerial Alliance, that is not aligned with one particular uh, faith. It is a, a grouping of people um, who are, man, they have huge audiences, right? Um, so, 
it's not necessarily that you have to promote um, one religion, although you could. I mean, you could have a series of let's explore uh, different religions or let's explore, you know, different uh, views on this certain topic. That's one thing. Um, but if you are really wanting to reach, let's say, a financial literacy program, um, you know, there are people that um, are attending churches and other faith-based organizations um, that, that they have a captive audience, so to speak. Um, so if there is already a really engaged uh, youth group maybe that attends, could you have 10 minutes uh, of Zoom time with them to promote a certain program uh, that the library is offering? Um, again, those are some great built-in audiences um, from some of those groups. Yeah, and oftentimes they have events. Um, I know one that we participate in every year is a giant back to school event where they're providing backpacks for kids um, and they go around and they get to fill their backpack with various things. And so the library is always there to share back to school resources. And so um, thinking about what events they're having and they might want to invite other organizations to the table and they may not have thought of libraries too. So, um, and it goes back to what does your community want? And if people are going Going to church then that's a great place to reach them like Aiden said so it's a great point and I love Gail that you guys took census materials to the churches that's a great way to reach people and and the laptops giving access right then and there I love it I'll say the one thing that stands out to me about this chart is that it shows how the library is the intermediary and the connector in the community because it's it's information is flowing in and it's going back out again so we are connecting you know, everyone around the whole community to, to gather as a central piece. Absolutely. That's how you get to be that connected library. And people see you as, oh yeah, this is the space to go if I need information to be shared out. Absolutely. Well, thanks for going through those exercises. And I know we had to power through them. You could really spend a lot of time thinking through those different um, spaces, but you have that toolkit now. I encourage you to share it. Re recreate this with your teams or your community and really um, point back to that point that Chris made of how can we really be a connected library. So we have our next speaker on the line. So Andrea, if you're able to unmute and if you want to turn your webcam on um, while you're doing that, I will introduce you. Um, so Andrea Pemberton is joining us. She is the executive director of TyPros. I guess I should put her slide up here. There we go. Um, so Andrea is the executive director of TyPros, which is the Tulsa Young Professionals Group, um, an organization under the Tulsa Regional Chamber that is dedicated to making Tulsa a more awesome place for young people to live, work, and play. Andrea and her organization value public libraries and view them as a one-stop shop for opportunities to learn and gather together. So thank you, Andrea, for being here today. Um, I actually connected with you through a colleague. So I think that's, um, I have to mention that as the power of connections and networking. I was like, man, who could I have on this panel from Tulsa that would be really great? And uh, it was her sister, I think. Um, knew about your organization and put us in touch. So um, there you go, connections and action. But thanks for being here. So good to see thank, you. Thank you for having me. I and hopped on a little bit in the middle of the community asset mapping, but that's brilliant and I love it. I might take it and <laughs> run with that as well. Absolutely, I'll send you the packet. <laughs> For sure. Well, I love, love, love TyPro's mission of connecting people, developing leaders, and building community in Tulsa. So what ways do you connect people and build community in Tulsa? Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So um, our organization is under the Tulsa Regional Chamber. That is our parent organization. However, we are um, a, a volunteer organization at the heart of it. I'm the one staff person and everything else that we, that our entire organization um, does is all completed by volunteers. So we see ourselves as um, the entry point for getting connected in our community. So not only do we have access um, to the business community, um, the business community also like really views us as um, an important um, voice for young people in our community and they highly value that. So it's really a two way street. Um, we are kind of the front lines whenever people are first um, moving into our city to reach out, um, to get 
show them the ropes, help connect them with um, some of the great resources that we have in our city and to help them develop and build friends. And for those who have been in Tulsa their entire lives, um, we are an opportunity for them to kind of rediscover Tulsa maybe through a new lens, um, particularly one of civic engagement, um, of opportunities to network, professional development, um, but we are constantly out in the community, um, really just front facing, trying to um, show the city how much young people are invested in it. And then um, in return, allowing young people to have a sense of ownership over the city that they're helping build and create. I love that. Um, I know that a large part of your job when we talked a little bit earlier offline is making asks in your community. So there are definitely times that the library has to make asks, um, whether that's building support for a vote or asking for coupons for summer learning challenges. Um, how do you build relationships while you're also asking if it's a cold call or what are the best ways to create relationships before you ask? Yeah, so um, certainly we, we make asks a lot <laughs> um, and we try to avoid cold calls where we can. Um, we do have a pretty built out network and we leverage those networks. Um, so um, for instance, we have um, active Facebook groups and we have a huge Slack community as well. Um, so if we have an ask that we're trying to make, what we'll do first is go to our community and say, who knows um, X, Y, or Z, um, and try to have a warm introduction where that's possible. Um, but if everyone's like, we don't really know this person, this is really our first touch um, to try to reach out to them. Um, we try to be intentional about um, if there's an ask that we're making that we can also really clearly state the value that they will get out of partnering with us, collaborating with us, um, so for instance, we can say, you know, we have a network and communicate with over 10,000 young professionals in our city every week. Um, so if we're asking you for this in return, we can offer you um, visibility, branding, kind of access um, to, our, to our established young professional network. Um, but we, we really um, focus on community building on the forefront. So some of the best recommendations that I could have um, for really any organization is to, but especially one that has plenty of staff, um, is to encourage and build in systems so that um, your staff or your volunteers or your board um, are constantly um, focusing on creating connections out in the community on a, on a weekly basis, right? That there is an expectation that um, your staff are allowed to go have a coffee or a lunch um, with somebody out in the community during the week. Um, or if you have an ambassador program, training up volunteers to really kind of have a better understanding of the library, to be able to speak to the library, especially if they're library nerds like I am, um, and to go out and kind of like sing the praises of the library and really establish those connections um, before you have to make any asks because the stronger your relationships are on the front end, the easier it will be to make those asks and the more receptive people will be. Um, so really finding intentional ways to make sure that your staff, your clients, you know, your champions as it were, are out in the community front facing um, and, and just have an opportunity to, to meet with them. Um, another great way is to um, encourage staff members to join boards um, throughout the community um, to find ways for them to get involved um, so that the network continues to expand. And that way, when you're like, hey, we uh, we need this thing, who knows this person or who has a connection, it'll be a lot easier because your network will be a lot broader. I love that. And I'm glad you mentioned that because um, that was something I meant to touch on earlier and I think I forgot. But if your organization doesn't have any kind of, um, we call it an outside commitment, but some kind of, you know, avenue to easily allow that, um, I would highly encourage you find a way to make that happen. I think that's so important. And, and it shows that your organization backs you um, without having to ask of, hey, can I join this? Or, you know, I've been asked to do this and is that okay? It's already there and already spoken for. So I love that. Um, you work with a lot of young people. Uh, your age group for Thai pros ranges from 18 to 40. Um, and as you mentioned, it's a volunteer led organization. Um, we also know in libraries that volunteers can often get burnt out or lose momentum. So what are some of the successful ways that you've engaged your group of volunteers and kept them connected and, and plugged in? 
Sure. Um, so first off, it's really kind of assessing what your volunteer base looks like. Um, for us in particular, we have a group of really committed volunteers, and those are the ones who are showing up all the time, are really excited, but they're also the ones that are more likely to get burnt out. Um, so making sure that if these are the kind of core group of volunteers that you're working with, that you understand their why. Um, why is it that they're showing up? Um, what are they? What value are they getting out of it? And continue to um, meet that expectation. So. For instance, if it's a resume builder, um, making sure that you're constantly like reaching out and asking, you know, hey, how can we help you meet your goals to further your career? Or um, if they're really just like, it's just fun and I enjoy um, doing it because it brings me a lot of joy. Um, ensuring that you're finding ways to make sure that your volunteer opportunities are fun and engaging and not just work, right? <laughs> you don't want um, your volunteers to feel like they're just providing a bunch of labor with no reward. Um, so making sure that they stay engaged in that way. Um, other opportunities, if you have um, really active and engaged volunteers, find ways to reward them, whether that's through an incentive program, um, whether that is um, doing like, you know, um, some retreats even. I know that that might seem like a big a big leap for volunteers, but it's a great way to make sure that they're bonding, staying engaged, and that um, you are in lockstep with what your mission and your goals are with your volunteers who are um, the most excited about championing your particular organization. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, when it comes down to it, it's just making sure that you have a great pulse on their why um, and continuing to double down on that every time because we know that our volunteers are critical <laughs> um, in helping us accomplish so much, especially when we are limited on resources. Volunteers really become um, kind of the key component that help us get all of our work done. So making sure that you understand their why and you continue to go back to that so that they're not experiencing high levels of burnout. And in instances where they are already experiencing burnout, make sure that they understand um, that you can take that load off, that they don't have to continue to say yes if that's going to cause them to want to leave entirely, right? Say, so take a few months off, take a few weeks off. We have other people that we can help um, bring in to kind of carry that weight and that load um, without having this kind of overwhelming expectation that our volunteers have to see things through. At the end of the day, they're volunteers, it's voluntary. So make sure that volunteers understand that and they will um, appreciate that very much and be more likely to re-engage when they're in a, in a better position too. Thanks, that's great. Um, I know that you work closely with the library. You just said you're a fangirl um, of the library and that uh, Tulsa City County Library Director Kim Johnson has spent time with Thai Pros and has spoken with you guys about the library. So tell us more about that relationship and how it came to be and um, just how you got plugged in with your local library. Yeah, so Typers in particular, um, we are not a dues-based organization, so we're free and open to the public, um, but with that, we're always looking for um, free resources. <laughs> so we have found that some of the best places to gather that um, are neutral um, are the libraries that we have uh, particularly in Tulsa, we have a system of 24 libraries, so that's a lot of options for us to be able to go explore different parts of our community instead of always meeting in the same place. Um, so that's a resource that we leverage very often. So we'd already had a strong relationship with our libraries by using them as an event space. Um, and then when it came to connections with Kim, um, who I'm also a huge fan of. Uh, if you don't know Kim, meet her, she's amazing. <laughs> um, but um, with Kim in particular, our central library, which is our downtown library, had recently undergone um, a huge renovation, a huge project. It is now kind of like the, um, the, the beautiful, like shining glory of our downtown space. It's a great place for everyone to kind of meet and gather um, and a great resource for the city. Um, so as that was being built out, Kim was getting a lot of recognition in our community for um, the amazing work that she had done and kind of helping establish this new forward thinking library. Um, and with our, uh, with our connection through the chamber, we had opportunities to reach out to her. We had asked her um, as the CEO of the library who had, um, really thought through and, and done a lot of innovative thinking and creative work with our libraries to join us for our all access event. So each year our organization hosts um, a vertical networking opportunity for our young people to meet the C-suite um, CEOs of, and community leaders and have an opportunity to have just one on one conversations. And Kim, you know, just said absolutely happy to be there. And our young professionals were blown away with the stories that she had to tell about um, the way that she 
has really been forward thinking on reimagining our libraries. And I think she even helped people to understand that it's not um, quote unquote like your grandma's library, <laughs> that um, there are, uh, there's you know lots of opportunities for technology, um, for getting engaged. And that's not kind of the traditional, um, you have to show up, check out a book and leave. There are all these other options and services the library provides. Um, so that was a, an amazing opportunity and connection and our young professionals certainly appreciated that opportunity. And then last year she was actually awarded um, our community award that we call the Boomtown Awards. We, uh, it was a um, public nomination. So anyone in the community could nominate. And of course, um, Kim Johnson was someone that came highly recommended um, and nominated and she was selected as one of our community award winners for the work that she had done for the city of Tulsa. So um, that was how our relationship formed. That was. Um, again, kind of a loose uh, network. Somebody happened to know her. Um, we were all really huge fans of the library and reaching out and making that ask of, hey, our young people would love to learn more about your, your story um, and what's happening at the libraries and the rest is history. That's so great. I just love that um, snowball effect, I guess, <laughs> of just meeting somebody and then learning more and, and uh, ending up with a deep relationship. So thank you for sharing that. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Andrea? Also, I saw Rebecca said she loves your nails. So <laughs> very, very important that I share that. But any other questions or thoughts? All right. Well, Andrea, if it's okay with you, I will drop your contact info in our notes so people can follow up with you after the fact. Um, I know we have people here from all over the state, so um, there are some up in your neck of the woods too, so they might be um, willing to invite you out or have a Zoom call sometime. But thank you so much for your time and expertise, and um, we're happy that you love libraries and libraries love you. So <laughs> thank you for being here today. Absolutely. And for any, if anyone who is in, um, in the Northeast region, it doesn't even have to be Tulsa, just kind of in that general vicinity, I'm always happy to reach out and help connect. If there are any organizations, groups, um, I'm more than happy to have conversations about other ways to help get you more engaged, um, especially with young people in the community. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much again for your time. I really appreciate it. You bet. All right, so it is now lunchtime. <laughs> so if you guys, um, you're welcome to hang on the call if you wanna eat together or we will reconvene at 12.30. Um, and we have an awesome speaker um, that you won't wanna miss. So be sure to log in at 12.30 and we'll get started then. But enjoy your lunch, stretch your legs and thanks for being engaged. For me. <laughs> It's lovely. It's lovely. <laughs> well, welcome back, everyone. I hope that you had a great lunch and got some steps in in between. So, um, and feel refreshed and hopefully didn't eat uh, too much to where we'll all be falling asleep. But the good news is we have an amazing presenter. So uh, she will not fall asleep at all during this time or any time. Um, but. I will introduce her. We have with us as our next speaker, uh, Christine Burney. Christine joined the Oklahoma City Thunder in 2008 and currently serves as Vice President of Community Relations and Executive Director of the Thunder Cares Foundation. She's responsible for overseeing the programs and partnerships that help the Thunder make a positive impact on the community. During her tenure with the Thunder, Bernie has helped establish the team as a leader in the Oklahoma City community and as a partner with nonprofits across the state. She oversees more than 20 ongoing and annual community programs that the Thunder administers, as well as the management of the Thunder Cares Foundation, whose mission focuses on building and refurbishing community basketball courts across the state of Oklahoma. I love that. Bernie's professional background includes public relations and community relations positions in both the corporate and nonprofit sectors. Originally came from California, Bernie earned her BA in English from Oregon State University and her MFA in creative writing from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. So welcome, Christine. And um, before we started recording, we found out that she is married to author Lou Bernie, who is a <laughs> Oklahoma award-winning author that has been to a lot of libraries, I think. So um, what a small world. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. 
Thank you so much for having me. I, I love the library connection. It's just awesome. It's true. It is the library connection. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a few questions for you today. Um, some people may be wondering why the Oklahoma City Thunder is here, but the Thunder goes well beyond just sports. Um, and you're involved in philanthropy, education, literacy, and more. So tell us a little bit about all the community partnerships you've established and what impact those partnerships have made in our communities. Sure, absolutely. And thank you again for asking me to be here. It's it's just such an honor to be speaking to a group of librarians and li friends of the library. Um, as I was telling, telling Kelly a little bit when we first got on and we're just chatting that um, libraries and reading and, and writing are just such a huge, huge part of my life. And obviously in the Bernie household, they're pretty big, um, but also very much for the thunder. Um, I, I have the, the pleasure and honor of um, working with a ton of different community partners in the in the work that we do um, in the Thunder's community relations um, world. Um, and I wanted to throw out to um, just when when because sometimes when you say community relations, people are thinking PR, which love PR used to do it. Absolutely. Um, but in in the Thunder world and in the NBA world, um, community relations really means the same thing as social responsibility. So it's about community engagement. It's about giving back to the community. It's about building partnerships with community organizations. Um, we like to keep what we're doing in Oklahoma. So um, over the past 12 years, we've worked really hard to um, build partnerships with schools and nonprofits and libraries and library systems throughout the state. I mean, we, we play in Oklahoma City, obviously. We have to, you know, play somewhere. Um, but we really want to um, reach across the state in the work that we do in local communities. Um, so, gosh, rattle off a, just a few community partners. I mean, we. one of the really fun things about my job is I get to meet new partners and new people, potentially um, new partners every single day, um, just looking for ways that we can help, um, you know, responding to um, crises even. And we did a lot in, during the, the more tornado. Um, but uh, a lot of what I do in, in my world is make those connections with community partners. So everybody from the food banks to United Way and their multitude of agencies, um, the public school systems that were huge on literacy um, and STEM education and reading. And so we, we really push hard with our school-based programs to reach um, schools across the, the, the state of Oklahoma. Um, obviously, and and for really for the past 12 years, but certainly with a, a more, even more concerted effort. Um, nowadays, we're, we're working on social justice issues, um, anything that from um, getting out and voting um, to, um, uh, I'm losing my words, sorry, um, criminal justice reform. Um, where the the idea of um, economic equality and equity is something that's really important to us as well, and that we we feel we have a platform to do something about with our um, newly launched or newly developing program in Tulsa called the Thunder Fellows, um, which which hopes to make kind of a pipeline for um, Black youth that are, are interested in STEM, developing those data analytics and hopefully landing a job and internship in um, the front office at an NBA team someday. So um, a lot of different connections. And really, I think the the one thing that um, I want to make sure gets across that we try to do with every single one of those is really prop up and amplify the work that those organizations are doing. We're, we're not the experts, you know, we're, we're pretty good at playing basketball. <laughs> I'm not personally, but, but the team is pretty good at playing basketball. 
Um, and we, you know, a lot of what we do in, in, in my world is look to make those connections so that we can get some visibility and, you know, we're a megaphone to community organizations so that other people know what they're doing. Um, you know, we have a big reach and, and um, we're pretty loud. And, um, and so when we can do that on behalf of a library or a school or a food bank, um, that's what we try to do. So um, across the board in, in any kind of connection that we have. That is a great segue to my next question, which was about how the Thunder has a really great reputation, um, not just of sports, but being community based. And libraries also have great reputations of, in our communities of being a trusted resource. Um, but we often find that we're the best kept secret. So what advice do you have for libraries to increase our impact, engagement and visibility? Absolutely. And I um I've been thinking about that one um, because like a lot of our community partners, you're short on resources, short on staff, um, you know, you're, you're doing a million different things in, in the work that you do every day. And the thing that came to mind um, the most when I thought about ways to help increase your visibility, I think goes back to that idea of, um, creating partnerships and, and connections. Um, I've found in the work that we do that it's, it's always, you know, it's always better when it's not just us, when it's, it's us and, and somebody else, you know, we, we can talk about certain things that are meaningful, but um, again, um, unless we're partnering with an organization that is doing that work, then with kind of empty words. And so I think kind of the reverse of that for you guys that or for, for libraries, um, finding ways to maybe even, um, I mean, obviously connect with other nonprofits in kind of innovative ways. Um, and this goes to sort of storytelling, which kind of goes hand in hand. Um, um, like I know the, um, one of the things that, that I just love about the, um, Metro library in downtown OKC is that they have this wonderful partnership with the homeless Alliance and, um, job searching and, um, just basic communication with using computers. And to your point, libraries are so much more than a place to check out books. They are really a communal spot and gathering place and resource for the community. And so I started just thinking about, you know, how, what are, what are places in the community that, that could help you tell that story? I mean, obviously we're one and we, I'm raised my hand. Absolutely. We would love to continue to, to help libraries get the good word out. Um, but I think also just sort of, um, uh, almost unlikely partnerships or, you know, finding um, finding ways to connect with other local businesses or chambers of commerce that are looking for, you know, resources for the community. Um, even convention and visitors bureaus who, you know, kid, people are moving to town and their kids want to go somewhere for story time and just sort of broadening that aspect of things. Um, because you're right, the best kept secret in, in terms of, you know, I just, I don't think enough people know about all of the things that you do. And so trying to identify um, those um, businesses, kind of, you know, folks in the corporate world that, that have an interest in that, almost every corporation has a corporate philanthropy department of some sort and, um, and has, you know, I don't know one that's not interested in literacy. <laughs> so um, that's um, just just trying to get the word out and, and trying to um, find those connections of, of places that have that megaphone that can that can help you connect and tell your stories. I mean, you're I'm I'm horrible at I was in PR for for quite a long time, actually. And I'm really not a good PR person. I don't like talking about myself. I don't like, you know, I don't like it. It just, it wasn't really my, my thing. But um, I do understand 
absolutely as a, as a writer um, and being married to a writer, um, the importance of telling your story. Um, you know, you're doing so many wonderful things and the more people that know about it, it may seem like, oh, it's just another Tuesday to us because the Homeless Alliance is coming in and, you know, using our computers and, and getting job search skills. But that's a phenomenal story. So just, you know, sort of looking at things in ways of telling those stories and finding finding people that can help with that. Absolutely. And that is our next activity after um, after we're done talking with you of ways that you can get that message. So thank you awesome. for setting us up for success there. Of course. <laughs> so one last question that I have for you is with your background and with your current role, um, what tips do you have for relationship building that you can share with our attendees today? What successes have you found um, either from your background or in your current role? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they they go to bit together. I mean, it's with me. It's sort of you you you, you see what you get. <laughs> so, um, and I think that I that I would actually point to um, authenticity as one of the biggest things in building connections. Um, and also, you I really can't overstate, even though I'm doing a lot of talking right now. Um, the importance of listening, um, especially when you're trying to build a new connection. Um, yesterday, uh, we had just a, just such an inspiring meeting with um, the new executive director of the OKC Black Chamber of Commerce and one of the board members of the Northeast Oklahoma City Renaissance, and um, just to learn about what they're doing and see where there might be connections. And, um, you know, we came to that meeting with exactly that in mind. You know, we did not do the talking. We answered questions, obviously, absolutely, if anybody had questions or was, you know, curious about us, but it was really a learning um, experience. And, and that's a lot of, um, that's a lot of what I do. That's a lot of what my colleagues and I do in in community relations is just, you know, reading about things, seeing things. I mean, I finally got on Twitter. It took a global pandemic to get me on social media, but I'm finally on. <laughs> and I know. <laughs> um, but, you know, that I mean, you see things and you you find those connections and you follow that thread. Um, but I think I think it has to start with a very authentic um, curiosity and and desire to make a connection in a way that's going to hopefully do um, some good for both organizations. So I think that that'd be my number one tip. That's awesome. I love that. Listening is so important, and I'm glad we got to touch on that today. Does anybody um, from our participants have questions for Christine? Comments. I saw Aiden loves the Thunderbook bus when they Yay! come. To the awesome! I love that, and I I can remember um, when the Thunder were just getting started. We had some uh, literacy nights where all the different libraries and literacy uh, coalitions went and got to hang out in the big mezzanine and and talk to all of the participants. Yeah. That was always a fun. Um, yeah thing to do that's i'm so glad that you said that because um hopefully when we get back to playing basketball in the arena and not in a bubble somewhere um we will be able to do that again and that's that i'm glad to hear that that was helpful because um that's another another part of what we do in our community work is just bringing those different organizations and constituents together so that's i'm so glad that you brought that up that's great. We have a question about how would you adopt those ideas into very rural libraries, maybe those that don't have the big business ties? Hmm. I think it's just a question. It's just a matter of scale. You know, I mean, um, it, even in a rural and and we do a lot of the work that we do with um, especially our basketball courts are in very rural communities and um, the last one that we did before the pandemic was in um, Boys City which five and a half hours from here <laughs> one way <laughs> 
And it was phenomenal. I mean, they literally shut down the city for the court dedication day. Um, and so I think it's just, it's really just a scale of, okay, maybe you don't have Devon Energy there in their giant tower in downtown Oklahoma City, but you have somebody, maybe, you know, it's it's a field office of Devon, or maybe, you know, there's, I'm sure there's a Chamber of Commerce. Um, I would imagine there's some kind of like business, you know, rotary or or things like that. Um, it's just, it's just finding the things that work in your community and kind of scaling it for, for what you have, what you have there. I mean, and, and, um, cause it, it still works. Um, it's, it's just doing a little of the, um, footwork to, to find things that maybe aren't as obvious at first, I guess. Yeah, definitely finding community asset mapping, which we did earlier, um, can help with that and uncovering, um, who, who you can ask in your communities for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and don't be afraid to ask, seriously. I mean, some of the, a lot of the things that I, you know, and I can't think of an, an exact example off the top of my head. There are so many times when I haven't, like the, the way that I find out about something is somebody's asking me like, hey, can you help us with this? And we may not be able to bring, you know, Chris Paul to their whatever event, but at least now we know about it and we can take some Thunder Girls there or rumble or, you know, share a tweet that they're doing. And so don't be afraid to ask, you know, even if the answer is no, one of the things that we really try, um, cause I hate saying no. And um, that's why I have to have other people on my staff do it for me, <laughs> but we really always try to find a way to say yes to something even if we're going to say no to the thing that's being asked. So um, don't be afraid to ask. I like that. And that's how we got you today. We just asked. <laughs> I'm so glad we did. <laughs> I'm so glad. Um, another question. A shared mission is important in community partnership. Has there been a partnership you found to be mutually beneficial, especially between a corporate partner and nonprofit? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I would point to, I think because um, of the audience here, um, our partnership, our corporate partnership and sponsorship really um, by uh, American Fidelity, they are our number one partner sponsor in our literacy um, and reading efforts. Um, they are the ones who they're, thank them for the book bus. They're, they're behind the book bus. They're behind the reading challenge. Um, we're working with them right now to um, kind of tweak both of those things in, in the midst of, of what schools are going through and whether it's going to be virtual or, or in person or a combination thereof to make sure that we can still get those programs out to kids. Um, so I think, um, you know, the, the relationship between the shared mission that the Thunder and American Fidelity have in um, really supporting public schools is just, it's been, we've been, they've been a partner since day one, and we really could not do the things that we do without their support. Um, and it, that's just, that's a, that's probably my number one example, honestly. I mean, they've been, they've been with us for a long, long time and we've, we've grown together and built things together and changed things together. And, um, but all with that shared um, passion towards literacy and, and public education. I would say um, as you're exploring that partnership even further, it's so important also to think about the people that don't necessarily have good Wi-Fi access at home. Um, and we know that a lot of times uh, those people end up at the library. Um, yeah. So in supporting the schools, I think all of our public libraries are working on that as well. And that would be a really good um, just thing to explore is that, you know, in, in that space of virtual school or homeschooling or whatever yeah. it needs to be called, uh, there's going to be a lot of involvement with support from the public library 
Um, so I, I'm so glad you guys are, are working on that. And I think there's a lot of uh, room there for everyone uh, to be involved. Thank you so much for, for bringing that up. That is exactly what we want to discover is who all is helping to support the schools because it's going to take a lot. Mm -hmm. And absolutely that digital divide and, and providing Wi-Fi to really 99% of the families that, that are in public schools is humongous. So um, I'm so, so excited to know and not surprised at all to know that the libraries are playing a role in that. And I would love to learn more. I think you guys all have my um, email address. So feel free to, to send me emails on what you're doing, um, you know, ideas, questions, because um, that's absolutely 100% something that we are, um, that we're looking to support. Awesome. Just made a connection just now. Yay! <laughs> and I did drop your contact info in our shared notes so that will be archived and sent out to our participants. So Perfect. wonderful. Out. And email email is usually the best for me. I'm a terrible phone call returner. So but I can return email any time of day or night. And that's what a lot of times you'll get something from me at, you know, 10 o'clock, as I'm sure you guys are the same way. It doesn't mean you have to answer it, but it just means that, you know, there's some quiet time and, and I can get something done. So for sure, um, I would love to hear from you. Well, thank Chris you so much, Chris. Oh, sorry. I'm Ava. sorry. I was just going to say, I, I did want to spotlight one other uh, program that I know the Thunder is involved in, and that's the Launchpad. Yes. Um, my good, good friend, Erica Lucas, uh, we were in uh, Leadership Oklahoma City together many uh, moons ago, but uh, she is a fantastic, she and her husband both, uh, Chris, they are fantastic yes. connectors and yes. they really help with small businesses. Um, they mm. have an incubator class that comes online all the time. And those are truly, um, small businesses from all over the state yeah. of Oklahoma. And I would encourage all of our uh, participants because we are representing a wide variety of uh, spaces across Oklahoma here today. Um, I would really encourage you to seek out some of their uh, past graduates from mm -hmm. uh, the launch pad and to look at those uh, small Oklahoma grown businesses to see how you guys can partner and yeah. amplify each other's voices because i think that's a it's a fantastic program um that they run and just you know the credibility and and the wonderful resources that the funder puts behind them but then also the care uh, given to small business cultivation and support i, I think it's just tremendous yeah that thank you for pointing that out that's we are we are so happy to be partnering with Erica and Stitch Crew on the launch pad. And um, I think our new batch of entrepreneurs uh, starts on a little bit later this month. Yes, so, it's soon, I think. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's very soon. And I actually have a um, have kind of a fun little brainstorming call with Erica tomorrow. So um, hopefully we'll be seeing even more from the launch pad in the future. Love them. Yes, me too. So many opportunities, so many good connections, and thank you for all that the Thunder is doing to enrich Oklahomans' lives. And thank you for being here and spending some time with us. And sorry we have to cut it short, but um, certainly we know how to get in touch with you, and we'd love to hear from you again. And tell Lou we said hey. And I don't know. <laughs> I love. It. I will. Thank you all so much for having me on and just for the wonderful work that you're all doing. I mean, it, it's it's so, so important and it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. <laughs> All right. So as Christine talked about, crafting your message is so important. Um, and so Chris is going to take us through some activities today. So Chris, uh, take it away. Yeah, well, we've been spending a lot of time talking about connected library and connecting to partners and other organizations and everything. So that's the first step would be prior to being able to do that connection, which is getting people interested in having that connection. So we are going to, first thing I'm gonna ask is everyone to get out their elevator pitch template, which was sent out in the pre-packet or it's actually in the first 
again, the other things that Kelly referenced that you can download um, off the big blue button. So get through that, um, pull that out, because we're going to go through that. Um, everyone's going to take a little time to fill that out as we go through this a little bit later. We are actually going to practice these in small breakout sessions. So what is an elevator pitch? Well, an elevator pitch, as you can see on the screen there, is a 30 to 90 second targeted speech. Uh, the idea is to introduce you, why you're relevant, and oftentimes closes with some kind of next steps or an ask. Uh, an effective elevator pitch is often very personal. It speaks about your passion. And um, Christine just mentioned, authenticity is everything with being able to connect with your audience and the people that are in front of you. So let's talk about three questions we all need to ask ourselves when we craft our elevator pitch. The first question is, so what? I graduated college in three years. So what does that mean you can do for, with, and through others? What does it mean you can do for, with, and through others? What is it about this that separates or matters and separates you and others from me? And no, for the record, I didn't graduate college in three years. The next question. So just like what she's doing with her flashlight, we need to search for and choose words that are dynamic and influence the outcome of what you want to achieve. The question you want to ask is, what is it that you want people to say or do when you are done with your elevator speech? So some of the nuts and bolts. These are the basic kinds of things you're going to want in your speech, which is kind of on that sheet that we we're looking at. But you're going to want to have your name, your title, and your organization. You are going to have some kind of hook or something unexpected about you or your business, such that you're memorable. Provide relevant information about your business and why it's important at this particular moment to the people in front of you. You want to devise and ask. You want to set next steps and then close with your name, title, organization. This doesn't have to be in this order. These are just the kinds of basic things that you're going to want to have in the speech in some kind of template. Children's call on 12. Children's call Pardon on while we're getting, 12. Uh, we're getting a little call in the library here. Um, so if you think about your butterfly effect or what you're trying to accomplish, which is kind of what this influence slide is showing. You know, one person leads to three, which leads to a lot. The greater your speech, the further the spread of your influence and your ability to accomplish your stated goal. So some tips. Let's talk through some general style tips as you're putting this together. Number one thing, before any words come out of your mouth, please smile. As you get started, take that smile and don't, take, don't start with attitude, but start with gratitude or something funny or unexpected. Something that says, you may be thinking about me in a certain way, but I want you to think about me a little bit differently. Again, smile. If you're tight and your shoulders are raised, the next thing you know, your breath gets shallow and you lose the ability for your audience to understand you. We all have a natural patter or pace to our speech. Just remember, you're telling your story, not someone else's. This is yours. So this, this should feel pretty natural. So it should be a little easier to have that smile. So just like the frog in this, imagine yourself telling this story as if you've told it 100 times in front of your friends. Imagine you're laying on a hammock regaling folks with tales of yore. People want to hear your story. They want to access your information. Nobody likes to be bored. The more you can relax, the warmer you can be, and the better people can access everything you have to say. In short, if people can't understand you, they can't access you. If they can't access you, they're not going to listen. They're going to turn off. So what is your ask of the audience? What do you want from them? What is it about you that makes you the person they want to work with and get behind on a project? I spoke about how we are telling the story. Well, the same thing goes to this elevator speech. Every elevator speech has an arc. A beginning, a middle, and an end. Where is your story going as you tell this story? And how's it going to end? So recapping, you got 30 to 90 seconds depending on this scenario. Just think of going up and down an elevator. Choose your words carefully. What is it that you really need to say and share? What words should I choose? Choose the words that will help you the most. It seems complicated, but it's not. Again, the words you choose are the words that inspire the action that you want to achieve. It's about understanding to impact to action. I'll say that again, understanding to impact to action. So it's right after lunch. So before we practice writing our elevator speeches and delivering them, we're going to move a little bit in our seats right here. So let's start by talking about the loudest voice in the room. It's that critical voice inside your head that says, I can't. 
So everybody put up your right hand if you've ever had a doubting voice inside your head. If you don't have your hand in here, I'll work with you later on self-awareness. Now, everyone, put your other hand up if you've ever not acted because of that doubting voice. What does that look like? It looks like I surrender. By not being bold, we surrender. Now, if we can just get a little bit of notion in there, back and forth, what does that look like? It looks like celebration, praise, and applause. Thank you guys for all your applause. Think of an entire crowd of people swaying like this after they listen to your speech. We are so close in every speech we give between praise and surrender. This is based on the words that we choose and the stories that we tell. If we can just get a tiny bit of that proverbial motion in our stories, we can go from surrender to celebration. Now, we need to practice writing your sample speech and then delivering it in these small audiences. I want everyone to take the next 10 minutes to practice writing their speech, uh, either on that template or on your own. We're then going to send everyone into breakout rooms, um, and the facilitators here will help us with that. So it is 103. Let's take till um, maybe just 112. So nine minutes. If you have questions, put, certainly put them in the box. I really hope more of you, other than just Kelly and I, were swaying along <laughs> since I can't see any of your faces. I, hope, I'm gonna I should have had everybody put their cameras on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Emily was. Excellent. Oh, Peggy. Thanks, Peggy. I okay. love it. <laughs> yeah, Gail. Knew we could count on you. Gail was grooving. Happy. <laughs> I love, love it. Love it. Chris, this is Emily. While they're writing their statements, just wanted to check on double check and make sure I was on the same page as you about how the breakout rooms are going to run. You sure. Want four, room, four rooms, correct? Yes, that'd be great. And do you want me to set a time limit for 15 minutes? Yes, let's do 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. And do you want them randomly assigned to the rooms yes. or do you want them to choose? Okay, random rooms for them for 15 minutes. Got it. Yes. I don't know why, but I'm waiting for people to be like, like apparating out of this session. <laughs> That's how this works, right? It just disappears. Yeah. We shrink and get smaller. Yeah. So while you guys are writing, how this is going to work is when you guys break into these breakout sessions, uh, they're going to put you in a room with um, three, four, five other people. And you guys are going to go around taking terms, giving your elevator speeches to one another. So that's why I'm asking you guys to write it all down now because you're actually going to practice it with everyone. And the goal is to probably to get through it at least twice. Nobody freak out. No groaning. <laughs> <laughs> and since we're doing randomly assigned, it will be kind of disorienting when people just kind of disappear into breakout rooms, I think. Um, yeah. And then it'll be a little disorienting because at 15 minutes it'll shut down and throw you back to the main room. So right. it'll be like a hard stop. So, so yeah, there will be some floating around going on, but don't freak out. <laughs> and Chris, are we staying together as a group to kind of debrief a little bit or are we joining these uh, breakout rooms? You can pop in and out as you want. Um, if you want to try and offer some tidbits, I mean, the thing I'm going to ask everyone else to do is to offer some suggestions, um, things that resonated with you that didn't resonate even when you wrote it initially. And, um, yeah, so if we hear anything, we can offer stuff and we should have the ability to float between the rooms and select rooms. Okay. Correct. Even if you're um, initially put into one, you can always click out of that room and then you'll come back and there'll be a, I think it says breakout rooms and you'll have the options of which one to join. Great. 
And if you're an attendee and you want to uh, turn your camera on, feel free because then people can see your face. Another thing to note is that if you're an attendee who is currently in headset mode, listen only mode, and you want to switch to microphone mode, you may need to reconnect, reconnect your audio when you get into the breakout room, which is just click the um, the headset button to leave audio and then reconnect with your microphone enabled. That's a great tip, thank you. It's about four minutes left. So Chris, I'm curious, what's the oddest place you've ever had to give an elevator speech? Or Kevin? Hmm. That's a good question. I'm trying to think, I talk about libraries a lot in my life. So like, it's a good chance it's anywhere I've ever been. <laughs> Grocery store line, yeah. like waiting in line at the bank. <laughs> If, if I've gone to lunch with Heather Thompson, it's anyone who's eating near us. Right. Um, we get to hear the elevator speech. I actually recently, um, we had our floors replaced and the guys were listening. They all had their headphones in. And so I said, are you listening to music or audiobooks? And they said, we actually listen to audiobooks. So I uh, pitched all of our digital audiobook services to them and chatted with that while they were installing the floor. <laughs> yes, yes. I think for me, I was at the business professionals of OKC luncheon and everyone, there was already a speaker up on the stage and I kept leaning over to this guy next to me, giving another five seconds of my speech in between things he would say, whispering. So to try and get across to this guy, you know, the elevator speech, obviously, to make that connection. Oh, buying a new car is apparently uh, a good place to get connected. Okay. The car salesman, last time I bought a car, is the, the only place I've actually in real life heard the must be nice to read all day comment about being a librarian. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that educational piece that yeah. sometimes we need to provide. Uh, no, I'm not a volunteer. Yes, I did go to school for this. <laughs> Those sorts of things. Less than two minutes. I feel like we need Jeopardy music playing or something. I know, I know. So is there like a countdown clock inside the breakout rooms or all of a sudden it just shoom, shuts down and we all zoom back in? I believe there is. This is okay. fairly new for us here at Amigos. We haven't used the breakout rooms a lot until these conferences we're hosting this summer, but I think that there will be, and Brian's typing, so he can probably elaborate that more, but I believe that if, yes, okay, Brian said there will be a blue bar along the top with a countdown, so. Wonderful. You're not paying attention to the blue bar, you might just be whisked back into the main room, but <laughs> if you can multitask, it shouldn't be a surprise. If you're coming to our session on Friday for uh, shifting from venting to enlightenment, you will also get to experience mm -hmm. a session. So if you need more, three o'clock on Friday. So last little thing, thoughts before we jump into this room. Again, as we go around the room, if everyone wants to offer up some ideas, some feedback, positive things that you heard. Uh, maybe if there's something you know that just could be tweaked a little bit for somebody, feel free to offer that up. Um, we all want to try and get better at this because it helps all of us. So as you go around, see if you can change it, maybe for the second or third time as you go around, um, and just see what you can do with it. And when we come back, we're going to try and recap it a little bit to see what you guys have learned. So whenever we're ready to do the jump. Okay, I'll go ahead and set up the rooms. Give me just one second. I'm very excited. <laughs> I'm waiting in anticipation. I know. Give me one second. I know I like, feel like I need a drum roll or something. <laughs> 15 minutes.
Uh-oh. Here we go. People are starting to populate. I don't know if it's happening <laughs> automatically. I see names popping up. I see it. Oh, their numbers are changing. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah, they are. If it's not happening automatically above the list of attendees, there is it says breakout rooms. You can click on that and choose the one to join. I told it to set people randomly, but we'll see. Theta and Lisa Lemkis are all by themselves. Oh. Oh, there we go. Seda needs a buddy. Room one. <laughs> if anybody does not have a room yet, jump over to room one. Yeah, why is room two so <laughs> populated? Hmm. I don't know. Combine room one with room two or three or? Yeah, I can pop into room one and see if Seda wants to join to maybe room three. So she has somebody, I'll be right back. So it doesn't look like Heather is in a room. No, it doesn't. Are you able to join a room, Heather? That's correct, Claudia. So I think you can just select a room to join. I wonder if some people like if their invite timed out or something? It's possible. Uh, so where did Seda go? It doesn't look like she's in any room now. Uh, assume I can't place Claudia in a room. So Claudia, do you oh, see where three now. public chat? Shared notes, breakout rooms. This is the only one in room one. <laughs> so now we need somebody else in room one. Maybe we get Lisa to pop into. Room four or three. Oh, Seda's chatting. She doesn't see an option for room three. So, Seda, can you join any of the rooms? Two, three, or four? You're all learning. Now says so she's in room one for Seda. She's back in the room by herself. Where did Kelly go? Did she just turn room her camera? Two. Oh, she's in room two. Okay. I'm going to join room four for a second here. Okay.
Yeah, room two is the popular one, apparently. <laughs> I, I, for something that was supposed to be totally random, I'm not sure how that ended up. But. Yeah. And it doesn't automatically send people into rooms? I thought it did. Like, I thought if I, if you're told to assign randomly, it would send people in, but I don't know if it's, that's immutable. Like, once they're in there, they have to, like, will the only option that shows up for Saita be room one? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. It looks like room one is the only option. So I don't know why nobody else <laughs> ended up in there with Saita. That is really weird. Yeah. The only time I've done this before is when people were allowed to choose their rooms. <laughs> Brian's typing, maybe he has something to offer. It does not look like I have the ability to edit the options without shutting down all the breakout rooms first and starting over. Oh. Looks like Susan Urban is in room one now. Right. Uh, you can say to go back in there. <laughs> oh no. I guess what I'm learning is for next time to let them choose their own rooms. <laughs> like yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And apparently, okay, Brian's saying to do the random assignment, select the option to let them choose a different room. I did not realize there was a checkbox to allow for that. So I have learned something new. Now, say it went in there, but Susan came back out. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I see. Oh, okay, Susan's typing now. Maybe we can get Seda and Susan in there at the same time, even though right. they have like five minutes left or something. Six minutes. Okay, almost seven. There we go. Maybe we got them together at the same time. Yeah. Woo! <laughs>
are we back? People on the attendees list have their first couple letters rather than a room number next to their name. That means they're back. Okay. We must be back. <laughs> I think we're live. So does anyone want to share anything they learned? Anything you want to work on? Anyone think of a cool narrative they'd be willing to share or anything you know you won't do again, either in the chat or you can just say it out loud? So I'll talk. This is Rebecca. I was in room four, maybe, I think. Um, and we talked a lot about kind of the importance of matching your elevator speech to where you are, kind of like we talked about this morning of that aligning goals with your partners. And so the importance of, you know, I love the outline. And so kind of having that outline in the back of your mind more so than a, a, a solid script so that if you're talking to, you know, a group of teachers, you can really craft that message that appeals to them. Whereas if you're talking to a group of business people or a group of healthcare professionals, you know, that, that speech may look different, but the outline is still the same and you're still kind of hitting the same points, but you can really um, change kind of the details there to match what they care about and what they're looking for. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You've got it. Yeah. Cause you're on every audience is going to be different. I want to call Gail out because she said that she really just speaks from the soul. And I love that. I think that really speaks to that authenticity piece. And uh, and again, knowing your audience, but also just being authentic about it and not trying to um, feel like you're selling something or, you know, coming across as it's unnatural or something like that. So um, good job, Gail. Well, for a little bit ahead of schedule, maybe we take a break till the next person. Yeah, let's take a break. Um, we'll hear from Claudia at 1.45. Um, so 15 minute break, stretch your legs, get some water, stay hydrated. And we'll be back a um, few minutes before 1.45. We'll start back at 1.45. See y'all then. All right. Well, I hope everybody had a good break. Um, you are in for a treat because we have uh, one of my favorite people here today, Claudia Swisher. Um, Claudia is a retired educator and school librarian and active advocate. Claudia spends her time advocating for education and libraries in Oklahoma and volunteers in a school library to stay close to students and books. She loves libraries so much, she's even married to a librarian. Welcome, Claudia. You, um, I know you through um, education. I yes. was one of your students. You were one of my favorite teachers and oh, taught reading you. for pleasure. So um, a whole class about how to read, which is awesome. Uh, <laughs> I can't really do that. But, um, but now I know you through libraries and uh, just staying involved and staying connected. But you are one of the most active advocates that I know personally. Uh, you spend so much time at the Capitol and talking about things that you're passionate about um, and you're always speaking up for your cause. So I wanted to invite you here today to kind of share advice um, with our public librarians just about how, um, a lot of different things, but how you craft your message. Um, but do you have any kind of background in politics? Um, how did you learn to become such a great advocate over all these years? I have none at all in um, politics, except for the fact that I was raised by a mom who was a New Deal Democrat, and my daddy was an Eisenhower Republican. And they laughed about how they would go to the polls and cancel out each other's votes, but they went to the polls every single election. And then when my dad retired from teaching, the two of them became poll watchers at their precinct. So he'd watch for the Republicans, she'd watch for the Democrats, they'd have lunch together and then go home together. So I was raised in a family where you were expected to be informed, you were expected to be listening and have an opinion and participate. So that was always a part of me, but 
I'm here to tell you as a full-time teacher and a mom and a wife, sometimes that activism has to go on hold. And even sometimes the in, being informed does. Um, teaching, like your job, is overwhelming. And you look for things to kind of give away and put in a shelf and say, well, I'll come back to that. Um, I started getting loud toward the end of my career. Another piece that I felt really Im important is the fact that a teacher has to represent her school, her district, and her neighborhood um, as you know, someone who maybe isn't as biased and as loud, that all of my opinions, all of my statements become part of what the community thinks my school is. So I muted my voice a lot until those last few years. And then I kind of let it rip. And um, I just, I got loud. I started informing myself better. And whenever I would post, I used to have a blog. It, I still have it. I just not very active. Um, I would post kind of incendiary things about school reform. And I would tell my bosses, you know, I can retire tomorrow if this is just kind of going over the line. And once I did retire, I thought, okay, now I can be a partner to teachers in the classroom by going up to the Capitol, by going to the meetings, by listening to floor debate, and then reporting back through social media what I've learned so that teachers can continue to do their job and now I'm kind of their voice and eyes at the Capitol. It has been a completely unexpected new career that I love. Well, you're great at it and uh, very effective. We see you out and about. And in fact, we recently saw you at an OLA reception honoring Mark McBride, who was the recipient of the Bill Lowry Library, Library Champion Award for yeah. OLA. So talk to us about how you effectively build relationships with representatives, even when maybe their opinions differ from yours. Um, I think becoming an advocate is an awful lot like just growing up and becoming a real life person and a, a teacher and a grown up. And it's developmental. At the beginning, you're angry. That's why you're loud, because things aren't working the way you know they should be. And then as you step back, you learn, oh, wait a minute, I need to use my teacher voice, but I need to use my teacher skills. And my skills involve making relationships, listening to people, um, finding information and knowing what is solid information and what's not. Um, and I'll tell you, one of your earlier guests, Scott Martin, Scott was my representative before he resigned from the House. And he and I learned how to um, find those places where we agree and agree that there are going to be places where um, my ideology and his just aren't going to match. So I keep my focus on education and libraries, you know, school libraries. and those other issues go by the wayside. I may be sad when a friend doesn't vote the way I want. Um, my own representative now, um, Jacob Rosecrans, is also one of my former students. And there are times when Jacob won't, you know, he doesn't vote the way I've asked him to because he's listened to all of his constituents. And as an advocate, I need to remember that. Um, Representative McBride and I um, started our connection because he um, became the chair of the House Appropriations and Budget Subcommittee for Education. And he was really excited to take this new position. He was an oil guy and wanted to just learn something new. And so our first meeting we both kind of knew that the other, you know, probably didn't agree all of the time, but we found those places to agree. And he asked me if I would help him um, with that um, 
Lowry Award um, information that he was sharing with you all because that really that was important to him and he was excited to have you know a, a Democrat friend who was there to support him. We've we've got to build across the aisles like that. I agree. And that relationship building and finding that place where you can build from is so important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So give us an example of a time when you were inspired by a message. What oh. was it that inspired you and how it was delivered? What was effective about it? Um, I thought about that question a lot. And what I finally hit on is the reason, in fact, I think I'm starting my 43rd year in teaching because I get to teach at OSU this for the last several years. And what inspires me is watching my young students grow and take leadership. And one example from my career, I volunteered for Special Olympics. And I figured out if I recruited students to come and volunteer with me, I didn't have to take those days as personal leave. I could take a field trip with my students and we could all go together. So um, I did that for probably 15 years. And I saw through my students' eyes how other grown-ups treat them and how they talk to them. And I watched my students become confident about what they had to contribute and stand up for themselves. So many of my students are now special ed teachers. They're teachers, they've carried that out. And very, very recently, watching young people take the leadership in this drive for social justice. My own granddaughter and her buddies would drive up to Oklahoma City um, during each of those days when the, the demonstrations were going on. They brought masks and they brought water and they made sure that you know anyone who wanted a mask had one and given people water. So that passion of young people, you know, still as an old, old woman, just brings me to tears sometimes. Kids are gonna save us. And unfortunately, we've done an awful lot that makes it important for them to save us. But they inspire me all the time. I, I miss my kids, but I get to see them in different ways. That's so neat. I also love your thinking outside the box of turning that volunteer opportunity into a field trip. That's really cool. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. I like that inventiveness. Thank you. Um, we talked a little bit about what it takes to um, build relationships, but what tools or resources do uh -huh. you have to stay connected um, with current events and advocacy? Um, I made a list, and I'm going to find my list, of local journalists that are just absolutely top-notch. The Frontier, which is a fairly new one, I can write those things down. Nondoc is um, stellar. Oklahoma Policy Institute, Oklahoma Source. I go to those places first because they keep the issues local. They talk about you know legislation, they talk about what's going on with capital, they talk about education, but it's all centered in Oklahoma. Um, they they are my rock, and I donate to all of them whenever I can because we've got to keep those local journalists. But I also have a couple of, of tools. There's an app by OAC. Oklahoma, it's a Oklahoma education, not education, it's an electric co-op, and they do an app for iPhones and um, Samsung, the, what do you call it, Androids, yeah. iPhones and Androids, it's called the 57th Legislature. Now, they're going to have to get a new one for the 58th next year, but it is just a treasure trove. There are pictures of the legislators. Um, there's a connection when you look up a particular legislator, you can call them from a link on the phone or you can send an email from that link. And I'm here to tell you, I've sat up in the gallery and have really 
appreciated something that a legislator said in debate, and I'll go right to that app and I'll write them a thank you note before we even leave the floor. Um, that one has saved my life, and I'm going to put a link to it in the chat when we're finished. And then there was a book that the school librarian part of OLA did a slow chat on, and um, I've got that address. Um, or it's, it's called Political Advocacy for School Librarians, but I really think it would be applicable for um, public librarians also. And that author takes you through national advocacy and local advocacy. And everything starts at the local, so that's where we need to be. And I have a link to um, a review, my review of that on Goodreads. But yeah, you can't do it all by yourself. And then you start learning people you can trust. And you make those connections. You always try to be truthful and honest. Um, if you don't know something, you say it. Because you don't want to lose that respect and trust that you've worked hard to build. But um, there, there's all kinds of... Um, resources for us there. That's great. Um, I also would be remiss if I didn't mention the new Engage um, feature on the OLA website from the OLA Advocacy Committee. Um, Aiden, I'm doing you proud. Um, but that's another great resource that is available for OLA members. Um, oh, yeah. It takes you through all different um, links and you can follow bills and see your uh, legislators and, and search. So um, Aiden will drop the link in the chat. So that's Good. a great one. And, and can I look too? Can I, can I creep in and look? <laughs> I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Isn't it? I think it's available from the public side, right, Aiden? Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I did, for all the attendees, there are a couple of handouts that we aren't going to necessarily use today, but I wanted to have um, made available for you. There is a Building Relationships with Elected Officials page. Um, there is a um, Advocacy in Public Library mm -hmm. handout that you can print out that's a, a bookmark. It looks like this. So how to get involved that way. And then there is a... Um, this is for 2019, and I don't know if there's one for 2020 because 2020 doesn't exist really, but ALA year-round advocacy checklist. So mm -hmm. you can take a look at what you could be doing each uh, month of the year that is relevant to um, based around their calendars and, and uh, their timeline. So those are all included on your um, in your downloads. So be sure you um, download those and save those from today too. So um, those are just a few of the really awesome tools that are available. And um, Claudia, definitely send us, if you want to send me that information, I can get that out to everybody too. Okay. Um, so I, the last question I have for you is, it's a repeat of one earlier, but I wanted to get your perspective on it. But what do you think that Oklahoma libraries are really great at and where can we improve? Um, you recognize that you are the voice of people who don't have a voice. You know, those families who can't afford books, so they rely on you and they wait in those lines trying to get those books from the reserve. You provide that safe, warm place for people, for citizens, and um, too many people, and you know, we saw this last semester with schools, don't have a reliable internet connection. I remember when at school, I would give those internet um, surveys to kids, and one of the questions was, do you have access to um, internet? And kids would say, well, what if it's sometimes? What if it's when my parents can pay that bill? What if it's when I can hook up to my neighbor's um, Wi-Fi connection and get something done that way? So. You provide services for all of us. I really get upset when I hear um, politicians say that, you know, libraries are the way of the dinosaur. Oh, no, you need to go and check. They are vibrant, busy, wild places. And I've been to the Norman um, Main Library, the new one, 
and your makerspace is breathtaking and just seeing all the things it can do. Libraries bring a community together and you're the heart of a community. And what I think you need to do better is brag on yourself. You know, advocate for yourself. Make sure those politicians know who you are, the policymakers who, you know, provide the, um, the purse strings and they're going to give you pennies or they're going to give you dollars based on how much they know about you. So I would challenge all of you to make sure you know who your state representative, your state um, senator is, and start making those connections. Make it before you've got an ask. You know, I just I just want you to know who I am because I tell I tell them up at the Capitol, I'm not going away. I'll be back. Um, so make that relationship and then be ready to um, call it, call it in and just say, now here's something we need from you. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Claudia, you. for being here. And thank you also for just joining us for the day. I know that um, that was an option made for everybody and everybody's very busy, but I really appreciate your time and being a part of this pre-conference. It's been great having you and you're welcome to stay on the call for the rest of the day. Well, thank you. Cause yes, I've learned, I've pulled those resources. I'm making a file. I, um, I'm getting information that I'll need to do my work too. Well, good. I'm so proud of you, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I appreciate all that you've done to help me in my career too. So you're a great resource and I will drop your info in the uh, shared notes as well. Um, okay. So use Claudia as a resource. And again, thank you so much for your time. You really bet. Great. Thank you. All right. And from there, we're going to go in directly into our next speaker, um, Crystal. Thank you for joining us, Crystal. Um, I'll read your bio and introduce you, and then we'll get started. Um, Crystal Reyes is the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Tulsa. Crystal oversees the city's resilience strategy that calls for using a racial equity and social justice lens in all city policies, programs, and practices. Throughout her career, Crystal has focused on improving the quality and quantity of early education opportunities for children, improving supports for families, and developing meaningful community partnerships. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, I was connected, um, I actually, I'm trying to remember how we were connected, but it was through, um, I think, our colleagues at the Tulsa City County Library and have heard you are a fantastic uh, resource and speaker and we're just really thankful to have you here today. So thank you for joining us. Okay, thanks for having me. Well, I've got a few questions for you, but first I just really want to applaud you on all the work that you've done toward bringing awareness and building resilience in Tulsa um, around the Tulsa race massacre. Um, that's I would encourage all of our attendees to read through their resiliency plan. I'll drop the link in the chat, um, but it's really incredible the work that you guys have done. So can you tell us a little bit about the resilient Tulsa strategy so the group can have some context and, and learn a little bit more about what you've been doing in that area? Yeah, and um, and remind me, this is uh, folks from all over Oklahoma, right? So all kind of far reaching. Okay, yeah. so oh, hold on one sec. I'm playing a video here. Um, I was pulling up a PowerPoint, and it's actually playing in the background, so I'm trying to stop so I don't hear myself. Okay. Sorry about that. So, um, so I am the city of Tulsa's chief resilience officer, and um, there are about 25 chief resilience officers across the United States. Um, I wish there were more, and I wish there were more in Oklahoma. So uh, maybe if someone on this call or in this meeting is inspired, we can talk about how we can create um, that position and, and strategy and embed resilience in, in, in cities as well across Oklahoma. So um, our uh, our city engaged with um, the Rockefeller Foundation about five years ago to develop a strategy uh, around resilience. And um, the effort was part of an initiative called 100 Resilient Cities. And each of the cities that were involved 
um, went through a process to develop uh, a strategy to embed urban resilience. And the way the, we define resilience is the ability of individuals, organizations, cities, institutions, whole cities to survive, adapt, and thrive through chronic stressors or acute shocks. And so, um, you know, I always say, you know, it really resonates on an individual level, right? We, we all uh, experience str chronic stressors and we've um, all experienced some shock, whether it's a personal shock, financial shock, um, you know, community level shock. And our ability to survive those things, get through that immediate crisis, um, um, adapt, figure out what the tools we need to, to get through and then thrive to come out um, and continue making your way forward. That is something we do at the individual level and it's also something that whole cities do. And so I my work is about embedding resilience with a racial equity lens into the work of the city. And the strategy that Kelly mentioned was launched in 2018. Um, it was a strategy developed in partnership with, I think over oh, nearly 2000 uh, Tulsa residents over the course of about a year and a half. And it speaks to the city we want to build. And uh, the vision for the city of Tulsa is that it is an equitable, inclusive place that honors all Tulsans. And we have four areas that we're working on. One is um, uh, honoring the diversity that is within Tulsa, um, honoring our past and using that to go forward. And so the um, centennial that's coming up, um, commemorating the race massacre, that's something that um, we are elevating that as a history of all Tulsans and then using that to um, even, you know, empower us to, to push for racial equity even more. We also have a program uh, to welcome immigrant Tulsans. So we call it our new Tulsans initiative. And that's part of the, the strategy to, to honor all our communities and to honor our past and use that information to go forward. The other part of our vision is that we um, want to support those that have experienced barriers um, to thriving. And uh, a large community um, within Oklahoma and within Tulsa too is um, those that have experienced justice involvement. Um, Oklahoma has uh, one of the highest incarceration rates, so um, it means that everyone is probably touched by um, someone that's been involved in the justice system or been involved in the justice system, and it's something that impacts not just individuals but whole communities. So we have some initiatives related to supporting economic opportunity, um, humanizing and destigmatizing the experience of being justice involved, and creating partnerships with those directly impacted to help us inform to help inform our policies. Um, the third area is around economic development, and um, one of the big initiatives we're doing is to embed financial empowerment into city services. So I always say, you know, if, you know, the city of Tulsa is responsible for paving the roads, cleaning the streets, make sure the streetlights are, are on, but also financial empowerment is something the city is also uh, responsible for because a, a financially healthy community individual is a financially healthy a healthy city. And so we'll be uh, launching some initiatives soon to, to embed those things as free public services for the city of Tulsa. And then lastly, we want to talk about, or we talk about changing uh, institutions, policies, practices um, that uh, have been barriers, that have been barriers to equity. And so um, everything from creating the office that I lead, so the mayor um, created the Mayor's Office of Resilience and Equity to house this resilience strategy and these equity principles and to embed them throughout the departments. Um, we also have hired the first ever housing policy coordinator to develop an affordable housing strategy. We've done uh, some internal work to train all our staff and all our police department on implicit bias. We are developing a language access policy to ensure that um, all Tulsans have access to city services, information, materials. And so um, we've embedded resilience in our comprehensive city plan. And so those are kind of the high level things that are in the strategy and that my office is um, implementing. And some, you know, we lead and, and others are led by colleagues in other departments and also community partners as well. That's awesome. You're doing great work up there. Seems like a, a lot going on. Um, and when we talked about the Resilient Tulsa plan, um, I know you mentioned that libraries were involved in crafting that. So my question is, um, how can libraries ensure that they're at the forefront of meaningful planning in their communities? In oh, your yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, so I am so excited to be speaking to a library conference because I think probably as probably everybody on this call, like libraries were a critical part of my growing up and, and how I um, was able to, oh, wow, I'm getting emotional already. Okay, it's been a long day. <laughs> so how I was able to explore the world, you know, um, you know, with, uh, you know, limited opportunities. Um, and so libraries just, um, you know, as you know, they're just very special places that are, um, I think someone once said, you know, the places where you don't have to believe anything, pay anything, buy anything, like you can go there um, to receive, you know, knowledge and the, the information you need. So um, I think, you know, the, the libraries are important because they're uh, safe places where people can get information. They're places where people can dig deeper into issues. Um, in Tulsa, you know, we have a great library system. It's beautiful. It has, you know, so much programming. Um, libraries are conveners. And so one of the things that I um, am, am really excited about is um, the work that we're doing to normalize conversations around racism and racial equity. Um, that's part of, you know, an overall strategy of um, institutional change around racial equity, where you're normalizing these conversations, you're organizing around them, and then operationalizing that. And so I think libraries have a really great role to play in that. And um, there's great examples of having, you know, community conversations and, and specific events where people can get introduced to these topics and then, of course, get dig deeper because there's so much knowledge and information available. Absolutely. And I have to give a plug. There is a conference session just around that topic of having a community conversation to cultivate yeah. talk on Friday morning. So um, if you want to learn more about that, you can tune into that session. But um, thank you for that. That's, that's so true that libraries are those conveners. Um, one thing I love about your strategy is that on page one, it says um, that this is an equitable, action-oriented, and collaborative roadmap for all of Tulsa. So when you were creating this plan, how did you ensure that this document um, that you were creating was actionable and collaborative? How did you engage others to kind of buy into that concept and take action with you? Yeah, and so I um, just to clarify, I did not create the plan. I arrived about a year ago in Tulsa, so I'm, I'm I had the plan already and am implementing it. But the two thousand people that were involved in developing it uh, were part of a, a, a intentional process over a period of a year and a half to provide input, have working group meetings, to um, provide guidance on on racial equity, and so. Um, that approach, I would say, is more is in the sort of involve collaborate realm of community engagement. So we involved community members in the development. Um, you'll see in the plan that there's very um, there's a description and there's very specific metrics that are related to resilience that that we're you know we think that these actions will contribute to. And then um, there's partners delineated um, as well as some metrics for measuring progress. So. We um, are developing sort of the metrics, the final metrics plan, but the uh, we're tracking the progress of all of these. Um, and I think working with partners helps you keep keep you accountable as well, because people are very, you know, there's a promise to saying that there's we're going to have a resilient, equitable city. And so the more partners we can keep engaged, not just in the creation of it, because sometimes that happens. You kind of convene people, they help you develop it, and then the city or whoever just implements it. Um, so we're trying to continue to keep people engaged as we implement, because um, that will a, keep us accountable, but also um, keep things grounded in the reality. And especially if we involve people who are directly impacted by the issues in the implementation as well, we'll get better results. Absolutely. Yeah. So in your bio, you mentioned that you are known for developing relationships. Um, so we've talked a lot about that today and how to build relationships. And um, I'm curious what your best practices are for building relationships and partnerships that last and are meaningful and mutual and impactful. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'm trying to think sort of I, I see the lens that lens in terms of um, the community engagement work that we do. So um, there is a, a continuum um, that was developed by uh, the National Institutes of Health that I use a lot. And 
it's, you know, a continuum of four sort of areas. I don't know if folks are familiar with it, but you start with outreach on one end, consult, uh, involve, collaborate, and then share in leadership. And so I find that continuum very helpful because it's sort of one tip or trick that I'll you know, say being very clear about how you're engaging with your partners, because that keeps everyone, um, I think, honest, you know, that we're OK, we're just doing outreach. We're not, you know, co-creating just yet. We're just giving you information. And so um, that's been helpful in keeping, you know, everyone on the same page. Um, and if you can then kind of work your way down the continuum, that builds trust and then, you know, lasting relationships. If you can get to a place where you're co-creating with community partners or stakeholders um, and developing and learning together, uh, that's the space I always like to be in. Um, and so that, that's some advice that I would give to kind of identify where, where you can have your resources to do that type of community engagement and then seeing how far you can get down on that continuum. That's great advice. I love that kind of model to to fall back to whenever you're trying to find clarity and, and structure with that. That's great. Does anybody have any questions for Crystal from our participants that you want to drop in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself if you are brave and want to ask in person? Hi, Crystal. Um, my name is Aiden Street. I'm with the Pioneer Library System in uh, Central Oklahoma. and I love the idea of uh, resiliency being broadened. Um, a couple of years ago, I went through an institute with FEMA for a community resiliency, um, which was fantastic. And I loved um, all of the things that were involved in that. But I, I love that this um, plan uh, and the things that you're talking about, just take it one step further. Um, you know, FEMA helps when we have natural disasters and being a resident yeah. of Moore, Oklahoma, um, that was of, of interest right. to me uh, because yeah. we had experienced that and we were interested in building uh, resilient uh, organizations and resilient partnerships and having good business continuity plans and, and things like that that I've uh, had the opportunity to work on. But I love that this is just taking it that one step further. Um, so you don't have you don't have to wait to have a natural disaster or um, a, a racial disaster or social equity type uh, disaster. There are things that you can be working on uh, to help mitigate that. And I that's a, a fairly new uh, interpretation of that word for me. And I, I'm just I'm loving all of that energy behind that. I'm wondering what drew you to this work. Yeah, so um, I, as I mentioned, I moved to Tulsa about a year ago and um, I had been, uh, I lived in New York City for the past 19 years. So um, the work I was doing there um, was policy and government. Um, I also ran a, a small organization um, in a neighborhood. It was a community-based collective impact organization. Uh, and so, um, and then my most recent position in New York was in the New York City Health Department um, and being involved in uh, community partnerships as well as internal change efforts around racial equity. And so, um, you know, I had never heard of a chief resilience officer before, you know, a year and a half ago. <laughs> um, and so uh, when I read the Tulsa, Tulsa's resilience plan, I saw it as exactly like you did, Aiden, like, wow, this is great. It's broadening this view of what resilience is. Um, it's so critical to have the robust systems, but you also need the the social resilience, the, the equity lens to really reap the benefits of having a resilient system um, that's yeah. flexible, redundant, that's resourceful, that um, is integrated and diverse. And so, um, you know, it just, uh, it, it was a, a role and, and something that just uh, kind of intersected in so many ways with what I had done working in children and families, um, and policy, child welfare, um, you know, uh, kind of community partnership building. And then most recently, this internal work around racial equity, which is, I'm, I'm really happy to see is more and more common now and very much needed to have those honest conversations about how we change internal systems to to stop um, to mitigate these inequities. I know um, for many of the people in our session today, 
spread out across Oklahoma. Um, they're not as fortunate to have a chief resilience uh, officer uh, in their particular towns or locations. But I think in reading through uh, your plan and just visiting uh, with you today, I think that it's very apparent that there are pieces of that that libraries are uh, natural partners and we um, either are doing a lot uh, to fill in those gaps in some of our uh, smaller communities and that um, viewing some of the work that we're doing and, and speaking with our city partners, um, you know, th that seems to be some, some hot button language for city officials. So maybe, um, reframing some of the language you know Chris led us through a um, elevator speech training just a little bit ago uh, before you jumped on so I think even reframing some of the programs and, and work that we've been doing for so many years but looking at it through the lens of um, these terms that that are in your plan I think that would really speak to some of the city's uh, needs for a lot yeah. of our libraries yeah I have a um yeah. So in the, uh, the definition of urban resilience I shared, and then there are seven qualities of a resilient system or project or program. And I basically have turned that into a checklist. And every time someone mentions a project, I'm like, great, how resilient is it? And just check off, you know, what is it being, you know, resourceful, reflective, integrated? Is there breaking down of silos? So um, I would say that's a great place to start. Just like have those seven qualities and see how, you know, everything that you're doing, you know, how many of those qualities it's meeting. I think that'll help normalize that, that language around resilience. That's a great tip. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I love that. Any other questions for Crystal? I really wish we had more time. I feel like we could really dig into this. So we'll have to continue this conversation and I'd love to hear more. Um, and if it's all right with you, I can drop your contact info into our shared notes. So if anybody is interested in following up um, with Crystal about this topic or anything else that we've talked about today, um, that will be readily available for you guys afterwards. All of that will be archived. So um, thank you so much, Crystal, for your time and for all you're doing for City of Tulsa that is resonating across our state and uh, making time for us today. We really appreciate all that you're doing. Oh, thanks for letting me join and, and best of luck for the rest of the conference. And please feel free to reach out. I'd love to talk about how, even if you don't have a CRO, we can have resilient, you know, conversation. So absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye. All right. And now on to our last speaker for the day, last but certainly not least, um, we have Heather Thompson. So while she's turning on her webcam and microphone, I will introduce her. Um, Heather functions as one of three business outreach specialists for the Pioneer Library System. She's nine and a half years invested in serving, brainstorming, and creating with her PLS team and community partners to provide programs covering business, workforce development, financial education, and sometimes spin-offs such as cast iron cooking on a budget and raising chickens in the city. She's a shameless nurturer, Kindle Paperwhite reader, Whole30 follower, wannabe food ethnographer, and home chef automobile concert singer, my mother of plants, um, also a mother of a human child, Mackenzie, and four-legged dog, Annie, and yearns to help others through her library role, and I love her bio. Um, <laughs> so welcome, Heather Thompson. And um, before we start into your interview, I thought Aiden could give a little background of um, your position and how it was created and the goals that um, went into creating this position that you have so successfully fulfilled. Thank you. Absolutely. Hi, Heather. Hi, Aiden. So as Kelly mentioned, um, this particular position for Pioneer was created a number of years ago, almost 12 uh, to be exact. And I know that because um, when I first took the position, I was very pregnant uh, with my son and he's 12 now. So that's, that helps me remember uh, how long that is. Um, but through the foresight of our uh, executive director, Lisa Wells, she was involved with an Urban Libraries Council program 
and that enabled her to have a project and that project was creating business services uh, for the Pioneer Library System. So this was a wonderful opportunity to have someone who really was dedicated to going out into the community, looking for partnerships, looking for ways to expand the library's reach. Um, and so one of the things that was so important for that position is that it was not a job that was scheduled with a regular time to be on the desk, so to speak. So this was a position that um, was given dedicated time to be out in the community, to make those partnerships. Um, and then it's just grown from there. So after um, I had that opportunity, we then hired um, two people and then now it's expanded uh, to three with a separate supervisor, um, all focused on business services community outreach, partnerships, things like that. So um, Heather, I think, I wanna say 10 years or so. How long have you been at Pioneer now? You're in the mute. Okay, I'm, doing, I'm watching that mute and unmute happen. So it's been, it'll be 10 years on December 1st. I'm ready. Yes. Yeah, I remember your anniversary every year. Um, but anyway, so she she's had that opportunity to be in there, uh, that position for 10 years and, uh, truly is a wonderful connector and networker. Um, if you're ever nervous about anything networking, Heather is the one that we uh, pair up for the newbies to go with um, because she is just such a natural, uh, has a natural gift in that area. So um, I'll let Heather speak for herself now, but um, just a little history behind that position. And certainly, you know, we're, we're fortunate enough to have those dedicated uh, people that can go out into the community. But with uh, COVID and, and with all of that that's going on, um, I think it's more important than ever that, you know, you, you keep up those relationships and uh, you don't you don't have to be going out into the community right now to create those partnerships either. So. Heather. I love that you are now unmuted. That's actually pretty funny because I'm always humbled when a manager reaches out and says, will you take so-and-so to an event with you? And of course I'm super excited, but what's also interesting is I share with those people that I'm shy and they never believe me and I really am. But I said, you know, I love people. I love the mission of the library and I wanna share it. And so that's, counterbalances the shyness with the caring about the library and our mission of just letting people know what we have available. The other thing that I really find enjoy enjoyable about taking, I call them networking newbies with me, is the growth that I get to watch. I'm privileged to watch them go from maybe standing really close to me at the event and then eventually seeing them go on their own with no other library staff members there to maybe even finding a partner to create a program with. And it's just a, a blessing, but also really a great opportunity to, to let them grow their leadership skills and also their networking skills and their connections. And I have to throw in here too, I've learned a lot of really good information and ways to network from Aiden because she was my supervisor for a long time. And so you, all of you people here today, if you wanna learn, you've got a great panel of experts, including Lisa, who have really helped me shape, shape the way I am today. So thank you. Well, thanks for being here, Heather. I asked you um, to be a part of this panel because um, all of the reasons that we've talked about, but also um, I think it's important today, we've heard from a lot of people that are not in libraries, but uh, you are from a library perspective. So talk with us a little bit about um, your position. So maybe not all libraries are able to create a business outreach specialist position, um, but what advice do you have for any library or any library staff member that wants to accomplish what you do, uh, but may not have that specialized position available? Well, one of the things as I've listened today is a lot of the topics have been covered of how to do outreach and network. 
And the neat thing about it is that that will play well with reaching out to businesses. And a lot of libraries already do that, but maybe don't think of it as in I'm reaching, I'm, I'm not as labeling it as business outreach, which that's what it is. You're really going outside of your walls and maybe even Zoom now to try to connect with some people that might help you with whatever it is that is your goal for the library. And I say that because we've all heard today too of, I think Aiden's mentioned, what are the goals of your library? And then another person has mentioned, what are your staff strengths? Because if you've never sent anyone out of the library to do outreach, you don't even actually have to leave sometimes. You can simply pick up the phone, do some Google searches, make a phone call. It's surprising how willing many places of business, nonprofits, even your local chamber are in connecting you with someone that can help you fulfill your need. So I'm very privileged to be able to, as Aiden mentioned, be a part of the library system where we have the ability to leave our desk and make our day where some days I start out at a networking breakfast in Oklahoma City at 7.30 in the morning and end my day at a Southwest Oklahoma City Chamber networking event at 4.45. And those are days where I just have so much just energy because I get to go and meet people and connect and share the library mission. And you may wake up grumpy that day, but guess what? By the end of the day, you've made just some fantastic connections or even just help someone sign up for a library card. So when you think of business outreach, it is, I almost want to say change the, the title of that or the message of that of sharing your library resources. And it doesn't just have to be in the compartment of business outreach because it's connecting like we've all talked about today and Kelly's really pretty um, PowerPoint today. It's, it's the connecting. So you're going to leave your library, whether that's virtually or physically, and, and start making those connections. I'm a big fan of visual. And so before Kelly's presentation, which I told her when I saw this, I said, this is beautiful because you know what I think in my brain is those murder boards <laughs> where they have you know, the suspect in the middle and all these strings. And guess what? You can't make your own connection murder board without attaching a string and pinning it to somewhere on your board. So you must learn somehow, use your strong people who they really like that kind of thing if you want initially, and, and make your first pin because it usually gets easier after you, you start doing that, just like a, a networking newbie. You may be a new networking newbie library system, and you can always call us and we'll help you too. I love that. I have not yet heard that my presentations are like a murder board, so thank you for that. <laughs> but I get it, all the, the yarn and connections. Um, Heather, you mentioned something about um, just spreading the library resources, and that's something that you are so great at. You're always talking up the library. I think Aiden mentioned it earlier. If we're at lunch together, somebody in that restaurant will leave with a library card that didn't have one before. Um, you have so many great stories about being that public representative um, for the library. So talk to us about how um, how you are successful with that, but also how you're a positive public representative in a healthy way. I know that, um, you know, without, you're a person too, you're a mom, you have all these hats you wear, but how do you um, still maintain that public representative um, uh, lens, I guess, in, in your daily life? Well, I want to say I, it actually is really enmeshed, and I mean that in a healthy way, because I, when I'm in Target, I know you all have heard me say there's a picture on my um, screensaver, and I am in a cat in the hat hat, and I got to go to Target, and I'm so excited because Target is one of the best audience locations for telling someone about your library systems programs for children. I mean, it's a, it's just a, I think again, in a virtual mentality of, ooh, there's a connection, there's a connection, there's a connection. And when I meet someone though, I am able to gauge mostly by listening. Someone mentioned today being authentic. And that's really what it comes down to is being authentic. And Lisa mentioned in our business before hours that you need to love people and I love people and I love the library. 
And sometimes I just need to listen. And so even if I'm not able to, you know, make a library connection for a program or get them a card, I've at least hopefully planted a positive seed of caring about that person and listening to that person. And maybe when I see him again, if it's a networking event, then that, again, that foundation has been built and hopefully I'm seen as a trusting person and they can feel comfortable to reach out to me again. But I also have to learn how to rein it in a little bit because not everybody in a restaurant wants a library card. So darn it. <laughs> but they'll leave with one, one way or the other. I love Maybe. it. I'll try to make it happen. <laughs> well, as we're wrapping up for the day, um, not to end on a COVID note, but you know, we are here virtually today and um, our world is changing. So um, COVID has changed a lot of things for us, as we know, but how have your connections helped you during this time of crisis? Well, I'm kind of going to combine, Kelly gave me a cheat sheet, just so you know. So I've kind of combined a little bit of the last topics and just shared this in a staff meeting with my team um, earlier today. COVID has actually rearranged my relationship with my partners. My day, again, could be networking, going to chamber events, and a lot of visiting with people in person. And of course, that's not that's not available. So I've racked my brains for months trying to think of ways to still connect with my partners, whether that's been by email. Some of them I've sent cards, there's phone calls, there's text messages, there's Facebook. There's also, I took the initiative of purchasing a Hallmark membership so I can send virtual cards because that's really important to me. And especially in this time of people especially the people, people who need that interaction, I'm trying to reach out to them to let them know I'm still here. And it may not be at all a conversation of what do you need from the library? It may just be me com you know, having a conversation with them and letting them know again that I'm authentic and I care about them. But the difference also has been that I've seen instead of me maybe trying to find out ways that we can do programs together, I've had more people reach out to me that have had changes in their job. They've had, they've actually quit a job trying to find a new job and helping them. It's, it's become mentorship. It's been some mentorship for workforce development for them. It's been ways of trying to help them reach their new production goals. It's been a great spin off and I am actually enjoying it. It is very different than saying, Hey, let's go meet for a hamburger. Instead, it's let's plan a Zoom. And it was um, very heartwarming yesterday to have someone tell me, you know, I don't have anybody else that I can do this with. And I appreciate what you're offering. And I never, I know that what we do is important, but just being authentic and there for that person was, was worth everything. So I know that this time of connections is really important. And I know we've talked about that all day long, but the library is, as people have mentioned, so much more than what our community knows. And so that's, I think every day that I wake up is, how can I let my community know that we're here? How do I let them know that they're important to us? So. I love that. And I don't know if you've got a chance yet to see in the chat, Heather, but Rebecca mentioned that one thing that she noticed about your listening is that you learn while listening and you share with others, um, meaning that you are a true connector in the community, not just connecting library to others, but connecting others to others through the library. Um, and you are that resource. So I think that's um, such a great compliment and it really speaks to what we talked about earlier today in terms of really partnering with the library and the organization. And there are incredible people and individuals with all of those organizations and you're one of those, but um, but you are, you're living the library's mission. So um, congratulations. <laughs> you're, you're a great, you're a rock star. Um, <laughs> So we're wrapping up today. Does anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts for Heather? I got a question for you, Heather. So um, sometimes folks are a little hesitant to to want to go out, and they they're a little fearful, or they even don't see the connection of what could exist. How do you help folks find connections or find the value in building those connections outside of the library? 
I think that's where my, I had to change. So the way I work, Chris, is really, uh, I try to explain it today to someone, was it's like a meal. It sits in front of me and I finish my meal and I pass my plate on and I'm on to the next thing. So what I've had to, as more managers have said, I'd really like for you to take this person out, was that's why the murder board idea came in my mind of how do I virtually show these people the connections? And so I've had to take a step back and do some downtime of looking at what programs have come from connections and sometimes too random connections. That's the neat thing is, yes, there's going to be some really specific events that you're going to want to go to. Just like everyone said, make your goal, make your list, but Every once in a while, try something different because you may meet someone there at, let's say, a Dungeons and Dragons virtual game day that is going to be someone who teaches teens how to change a tire for a program. It's it's think outside the box, be open minded, but also sometimes the value, again, is just implanting the seed and Sometimes, Chris, people don't want to go really to the networking events and they go and I try to point out to the person that's with me who who some of the people are and the key players that they are in our community. Because to me, that person that I'm saying, you know, that's the president of Norman Regional Hospital. To me, I might need to provide a little backstory of why that person is important in our library system, but they are, and they deserve the respect of, of saying hello and thanking them for whatever it is that they do for us. And I think that that's where the authenticity and the relationship building is really important. And even sometimes going to networking events and taking back the little nuggets of information or sometimes just it's putting a card on someone's desk and saying, hey, I met this person, they're interested in a program, and then you let it go. But I think planting a seed is always something that's important. Thank you, Heather. And, and again, um, I'll drop your contact info into the notes so people can follow up. Um, but this is a great OLA member who um, is also a great resource. So be sure to reach out. And thank you so much for your time and expertise today. Appreciate it. All right, so we are coming to a close of our lovely day together. Um, and if you remember all those uh, 285 minutes ago, I said that what I want you to take away from today is action. So um, in your downloadable handouts, there is an action plan. So if you'll pull that up, um, what I want you to do is just spend a few minutes uh, writing a commitment to action. Um, something that you want to take a step forward on um, in the following timeline. So I want you to think about something that you can apply that you learned today uh, by the end of conference. So that's by Friday, five o'clock or four o'clock. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> four or five central standard time. Um, what do you want to take a step forward on um, within the next month? What do you hope to take action on? And then before this time next year, um, which can either be summer or if you want to set a deadline for yourself of what do you want to accomplish before conference next year? Maybe you want to have a new partnership established. Maybe you want to have tried out your elevator pitch, um, maybe contacted a legislator and shared a message with them. Um, Maybe it's reaching out to a colleague and asking them to mentor you in one of these areas. Um, but take a minute or two to write down what you want to take action toward. Um, and while you do that, I'm going to drop some contact info in the shared notes before this closes out today. Um, and then we have one more uh, quick activity, or not activity, but follow up. So don't sign off just yet. Um, go ahead and fill out your timeline and your action plan. Um, I'll give you a minute to do that. Kelly and Chris, I really love the idea of planting the seed um, because that that is what it takes sometimes. Um, you know, you might reach out to someone and you let them know about something amazing. And then, you know, a little bit of time passes and, oh, didn't you tell me once about XYZ? Yes, let's get together. Maybe it doesn't happen. 
But you know what? You plant that seed enough times, something is going to come up. Um, they, whenever they have a need, um, it could be a year from now, two years even. But if you stay persistent and you put yourself out there, there's going to be a time when they might have a need. Maybe it's um, related to a program or partnership. Maybe it's just a personal need, um, you know, with situations that are changing uh, all over, jobs or schooling or whatever. Just keeping yourself out there as a resource, sooner or later, uh, they're going to remember. And, and when it's actually their time that they do need something, um, you can be there for them. So planting that seed and, and just being patient, I think, is important as well. It doesn't all happen overnight. I totally agree. And I think that um, that message, too, um, of, you know, there's so much to convey that the library does. And um, you're trying to condense all of this stuff into a two minute speech. But if you really touch on something that could come back, like if you know your audience and, um, and I always say to you don't know that you need the library till you need it, which is not, I don't know that that makes sense to anybody else, but um, how many people have you seen come back and they're like, oh my gosh, you told me about this thing, financial education like three years ago and I thought I knew all about it and now I don't. So um, yeah, you never know who you can touch in those moments. That happened to me recently. Uh, I, a customer had I had met at a an event probably almost four years ago now, hadn't heard from in four years, reached out to me and said, hey, I've got something that I want to connect to the library. I remember you said something about something. Is there any chance we could? I'm like, yeah, sure. I find that so much working with students also, working with teenagers. I talk to them about, you know, test help, test prep, um, you know, online tutoring, things like that. You, you talk to the parent organizations, you know, PTA, all of that. And it's not till that test is actually coming up or they actually start to struggle in a certain subject. Oh, doesn't the library have something to do with that? Yes, absolutely. Let's get started. I love it. All right. So hopefully you found some things that you want to work on and take in action toward um, by this week, by the end of next month and before this time next year. So what I want you to do now is I want you to, you can do this in the uh, public chat or if you want to click on someone's name, you can send a private chat. But I want you to find somebody that you've either met through your breakouts today or seen comments from. And I want you to um, invite them to just engage in conversation. Obviously, we can't meet in person probably right now, but um, just touch base with somebody before you leave here today. Um, and you don't have to fill this out right now or ever if you don't want to, but there is an accountability agreement on the back um, on your second page of that uh, action plan. And it is a time for, or it's a space for you to really commit to one other person to follow up and hold you accountable for your action plan. So um, if nothing else, I want you to just reach out to one person and say, hey, can we touch base next week? Or um, here's my email, let's get together at some point. But I want you to make that contact with someone today um, and start building your network um, or expanding your network if you already have a great one. Um, you can always add more friends to that. So um, make that one personal out, um, reach out, and you have, I think, nine minutes to do that. Um, so either in the public chat or privately, um, please touch base with somebody. But um, And while you're doing that, I'll advance. Um, if anybody has questions, um, this is our contact info for the three of us, Aiden, Chris, or I. So if you have any comments or feedback, or anything um, that you want to share with us, please contact us. Um, I'm sure there are also evaluations for conference that exist. So um, please take um, those evaluations and give your feedback on whether this was helpful today and what we could do better for the future. Um, and just finally, thank you for bearing with us in this virtual world. Um, I think it went pretty smoothly. If nothing else, we didn't get to stretch our legs as often. And yeah, lunch, missing out on lunch was 
the status. But um, but I hope to see you all virtually uh, throughout the rest of this week. Um, and oh, thank you, Rebecca. Evaluation link is in the chat, so please fill that out. Um, and then as a reward for sitting for 292 minutes, um, we have a bonus, a $5 off coupon code. This was courtesy of the, um, intellectual, the equity, diversity, inclusion, and intellectual freedom round table. So, uh, you can snap a picture of this code and save some money at the ALA store for some swag, but thank you guys for being here. Um, this day. And thanks, Chris and Aiden, for your time and expertise and to all of our wonderful speakers. I hope that um, you learned something today and have something to take away. I would love to give one last pitch out. For those that have not read their OLA email from this week, from Monday, please read that email because there is a link to the scholarship baskets. It's online this year. Uh, you can, it's, it basically, it's a web-based platform that directs it to your phone. Uh, it's text. You get text notifications about it and um, bid on those baskets. And after the conference, we will find a way to get those to you through that drock. And it's nice and easy. You can do it right from here as opposed to having to stop by the table like you normally would. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Chris. And I think Lisa has a, a great point here, too. We, we do have some fellow pioneers uh, on the call. So if you... Um, did participate today, make sure you log this as a learning experience in your Beanstack uh, Summer Learning Challenge. And then we also have the auction link here too. Man, you guys are so great. Um, I wanna give a special uh, thank you to Kelly for persevering and wrangling uh, Chris and I and all of the amazing speakers that you heard today uh, between, hey, let's, let's, what do you think about this? to, um, yeah, let's do it. Okay, we're all in person. Oh my gosh, nope, we're gonna be all virtual. So um, anyways, kudos to Kelly uh, for keeping up with all of us and um, making this such an enjoyable experience. And uh, thank you to everyone that participated today as well. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at that Engage page. Uh, it is linked on the Oklahoma uh, Library Association page. I also dropped the link in the chat. Um, if you need someone to speak to your employees about it or just about that advocacy in general, um, the advocacy committee, we'd be more than happy to. Um, that's the royal we. It's probably going to be me. Uh, <laughs> but either way, uh, just wanted to encourage everyone uh, to connect and to use the wonderful resources that were presented today. Definitely, OLA is such a great resource. So definitely um, use that value of your membership because you'll get a lot out of it. And thanks again to, I feel like now it's like the credits, you know, that's scrolling through, but thanks to Amigos for putting us online and all the great training and bearing with us as we ask them to do things that they've never done before. So thanks for <laughs> letting us be your guinea pigs and uh, to the conference planning committee. It's gonna be a great conference. I look forward to seeing you all keynote session tomorrow morning. Um, it will be fantastic. So we'll see you all virtually there and uh, Contact us if you need anything. We'll hang on until three o'clock. Um, but thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>